I'm not surprised also to hear the language of Fed Chair Jay Powell. They're committed to going at this gradually. I think more surprising in the market was hearing taper talk start. What they don't want to do is take a dramatic and drastic action to really result in a sharp shift. Whether it's fiscally or consumption, there's really no cliff out there that we see right now. Of course the economy is experiencing some frictions. We rebooted the global economy. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Tom Keen has left the building alongside me, Lisa Abramowitz and Taylor Riggs. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures up 20 on the S&P 500, 42.51 on the S&P. Lisa, we start this morning with exactly the way we started yesterday. Just insert a different bank. First, it was Morgan Stanley, and it looks like J.P. Morgan might follow. The idea here is requiring employees to get vaccinated before they come into the building, or frankly, just requiring them to get vaccinated altogether. This is what we were talking about yesterday. How much is Morgan Stanley the first mover setting a precedent for the rest of the Wall Street banks? I love this memo, though, that was sent out to employees yesterday. Uh, by JP Morgan. Report your status for vaccination uh, by the end of the month. If you do not, you'll be work uh, contacted repeatedly by your manager. Not messing around, are they? <laughs> Get back to work seems to be the story. Get vaccinated too. Yeah, and frankly, they're leading the charge when it comes to mandating vaccinations. You're not seeing that in the public sector. How much is the private sector really going to set the tone for what we can expect once the FDA gives the final approval to these vaccines? Taylor Riggs, thank you very much for waking up early for us. Thank, thank you, you for you. allowing me to be an three interloper hours. on well, the Let's show. talk about this. Let's talk about JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, putting the pressure on people to get back to work. I don't know if I went out from New Jersey repeatedly contacting me, John, but it really does underlies. We're coming off the election here, of course, in New York City for the mayoral election. Sort of this push of what is an economic recovery of this city look like? What does this vaccine push look like? What does this mean really for some of the economic data as well as we push forward to what sort of this job recovery continues to look like and the interconnection so much with the vaccination rate? As we go deeper into summer, and Lisa, I've got to say September seems to be the date in many people's diary. Yeah, the people think that you're going to have to get back to work. Again, though, I do wonder uh, whether we'll get FDA approval and really whether companies will go re absolutely reverse their whole work from home uh, idea and ethos and say, the office is where you've got to be. Watch this, a market check without interruption. Deep breath, enjoy the moment. 42.51 on the S&P 500. Tom Keane <laughs> away for the next couple of days. Futures up 20 on the S&P. We advanced by a half of 1%. A nice lift to this market this Thursday morning. Ahead of jobless claims a little bit later. Lisa will run you through the diary in just a moment. Yields are higher by almost the basis point at 149.36. Euro firmer off the back of some pretty good confidence numbers coming out of the continent. 119.43, Lisa, on Euro dollar. I got to say, when you said that, John, I almost wanted to interrupt you just because it felt familiar. That's all I can say. It felt like, I you won't know, interrupt you. Home. Carry on, please. Okay, all right. 8.30 a.m., we're going to get a slew of economic data. U.S. initial jobless claims expected to come in below 400,000 for the first time since the peak of the pandemic. Uh, also getting the first quarter GDP figure. This is the third reading. Expected to be largely the same at this incredibly high pace of more than 6%. However, there could be a downside surprise when it comes to the trade dynamic here, given uh, some of the imports and, frankly, uh, the lack of exports amid some of the supply shortages. 1 p.m., this is the exciting auction. The U.S. is planning to sell $62 billion of seven-year notes. This is the Treasury auction that has been the most volatile. However, yesterday's five-year note sale actually came in relatively stable, a little bit weaker in certain of, of the internals, but still uh, definitely solid demand despite some of the rhetoric around hiking rates and uh, tapering some of the monthly bond purchases. And 4.30 p.m., the Federal re release the stress test results. The expectation is for all six banks to pass with flying colors and then for them to possibly even double uh, their dividends and stock buybacks over the next year. My question is, how will the markets respond? This expectation is baked in. How much will this give a boost to bank evaluations if this uh, does come to pass and they do uh, pass the stress test? Or, John, how much is this basically just basically par for the course. Well, let me ask you this. You're more interested in how the market responds or how Washington responds? Well, 
at this point how the market responds because honestly there's so many priorities in Washington DC whether it's infrastructure or frankly big tech that's more in their crosshairs right now than Wall Street that yeah you're going to hear uh, you know Senator Warren come out and say how can they be making so much money and do all these stock buybacks but it's going to be more sound than really uh, than, than actually coming through with anything. The Twitter account of Senator Warren want to watch maybe a little bit later <laughs> this afternoon if you like that kind of thing. Hugo Rogers joins us now Dantec Bank and Trust Chief Investment Officer. Hugo great to catch up as always had a week of a little bit of volatility I guess my first question for you is is it a bump in the road or are we just on course for more of the same is that what the story for this last week we think it's a bump in the road to answer your question pretty directly good morning everyone thanks for thanks for having me um the the bump in the road is that the road to recovery in inflation if it's not a bump in the road then effectively people's assessment is that this is already the end of the cycle when we haven't even started um we have unemployment is still above six percent we've still got eight million jobs to 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 get back in, eight million workers to get back into the workforce, eight million jobs to create um, before we start getting into the cycle. You know, for us, it's simple to imagine the cycle already ending when um, when there are no rate hikes due, even on the more hawkish forecasts you saw last week till 2022. So, um, so we think it's a bump in the road. We think uh, people got overexcited about inflation. We've always been telegraphing our view that inflation is normalising. It's not breaking out aggressively to the upside. There's no reason yet to, to doubt the transitory assessment of the Fed. Well, Lisa's written about this recently. I'll ask you the question, and no doubt Lisa's going to want to follow up on it. What does it tell you that we had the kind of moves we had off the back of a very incremental move in the communications from the Federal Reserve? Yeah, I mean, it tells you that there are lots of passengers on one side of a ship. Uh, you saw the, the, the open interest in, in the Treasury market. There was a, a squeeze available there. There's actually a, a shortage of inflationary assets. Your introductory piece spoke about banks. Obviously, everybody knows about the buybacks. But um, you know, the, the main vehicle or the, the way people use investments in banks is as an inflation hit because banks are used uh, as their lending longs, they're borrowing short lending on their, they're basically a play on the yield curve. So, uh, so that yield curve flattening was very bad for that. Um, but it, it speaks to a dearth of true inflation hedges and people got on, on one side and, um, and were surprised that inflation may be actually benign, which we, we think at the moment is it's not exactly benign. There are risks to break out to the upside, but core inflation at two and a half if you adjust for um, the base effects, that is normalization rather than any kind of panic situation. Hugo, there is a question about the accuracy, though, about some of these inflation gauges that you talk about. The idea here that the Fed has been involved in these markets and that, frankly, there is a lopsided amount of securities available for purchase as well as uh, dollars to buy them. How much can we actually read from break-even rates in terms of expectations for future inflation versus what people are paying for their cars, their homes, frankly, even at the grocery store? Yeah, the, the distortions in the bond market are, are, are well known. The, the Fed's still buying $120 billion of assets every month, and the money supply growth may have dropped from 25% down to about 15%. There's still oodles of money out there. All you have to do is look at that reverse repo now. Look at the $750 billion that's having to find a home, desperate to find some positive uh, returns. So there's a lot of distortions in the bond market. We think, think you need to be very wary about signals from the bond market saying the cycle's over, that inflation is truly benign. Uh, we think that, that those things can reprice steadily as liquidity is withdrawn because they're, they're too distorted, even if inflation proves to be a little bit stickier. So um, that signal needs to be read very carefully. But the other signal that needs to be read very carefully is, is some of the inflation measures themselves. So everybody knows that the, 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 the inflation number hitting 5%, largely down to used cars, hotel rooms, a quite narrow band of, of goods and services that are motoring away. The, to understand whether there's going to be a sustained breakout in long-term inflation, you have to look at the jobs market, you have to look at wages, and still there's excess capacity there. So at the moment, we are thinking that the transitory assessment is the, is the right one. 
with the asset purchases, does the type of tapering matter equal weight between MBS and Treasuries or perhaps maybe more a shift in a focus to MBS given some of the housing data as of late? Yeah, the, the, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent question. So the, the, the type of tightening does matter. We've seen in Europe, actually, there was a, a shortage of assets to, to buy in these bond buying programs. So I think what that is, is a nod to where the Fed thinks that they are distorting the market most severely back into the real economy, away from lateral requirements of banks and so on. So, so the tightening in MBS is, is I think, a function of the, the market structure rather than we're looking to quell a housing bubble or something despite ra rapid price increases. But it will affect the real economy in different ways. And yes, the data you've seen on, on house prices, they're not trying to cool a hot house, housing market. Actually, what's happened is prices, input prices and, um, and house prices themselves have started crimping demand. Um, but also, you've got other considerations now. Now, maybe you're going to be going back to the office, as, as your introductory um, piece suggested. So, so that, that big rush to, to move out of central business districts and small flats into somewhere bigger, that is now over. We're, going to, we're entering a wait-and-see phase there, including in the housing market. And, you know, you, the main message from the Fed will be incrementalism. Hugo Rogers, probably the luckiest man in finance. I get jealous every time he I comes know. on. It's very summer, <laughs> isn't it? Very summer okay. cash with the with the white jacket. Yeah, just he's looks good. utterly charming, John. Thank you so much. Good to see you, Hugo. He's as in always. Bahamas, very good to see you. right? I know. Hugo well, Rogers, a Dowtech Bank of the Bahamas, Lisa. Yeah, do you think he goes to the beach in his free time? Maybe straight after this. Yeah. I have no <laughs> idea. Like Maybe this is the morning's work. Done. <laughs> a tang mimosa uh, along with Tom Keen. It looks like a good place to work. You I think, think Taylor, moving? I think Taylor, to be honest with you, asked the right question. Taylor, I asked that question to President Williams of the New York Fed, and he pushed back a little bit. I think they're worried about the broader signaling from any reduction, whether it's MBS or Treasuries, just the broader signaling for the broader market. So interesting. I went back to read uh, the December 2013 announcement on the taper and making it very clear, John, that it would be equally weighted between $5 billion in Treasuries, $5 billion in MBS. And increasingly, though, in the last few weeks, I've heard more discussions of how do you do that. Uh, Mr. Bossig yesterday saying that we might look at taper in three to four months. That sets us up nicely for September but we'll wait and see. We'll catch up with Mr. Dudley a little bit later. Bill Dudley, Bloomberg Opinion columnist and, of course, former Federal Reserve Bank of New York president. Looking forward to that. Equity futures with a lift this morning. Good morning. Up 20 on the S&P, 42.51 on the S&P 500. We advance a half of 1%. This Thursday morning, this is Bloomberg. With the first one news, I'm Rutika Gupta. U.S. officials are confirming that details of the genetic makeup of some of the earliest samples of coronavirus in China were removed from an American database where they were initially stored at the request of Chinese researchers. The U.S. National Institutes of Health says that the data first submitted to the U.S.-based sequence read archive in March 2020 were requested to be withdrawn by the same researcher three months later. South Africa's daily COVID-19 infections rose to nearly 17,500, the highest number recorded in the country's third resurgence of the virus, according to the National Institute of Communicable Diseases. With 1.86 million people infected and more than 59,000 deaths, South Africa has the highest number of confirmed coronavirus infections and deaths on the continent. Bullish, a cryptocurrency exchange backed by a group of billionaires, including Peter Thiel, is in SPAC merger talks with Far Peak Acquisition. Bloomberg's learned the deal could value bullish at nearly $12 billion with an agreement possible in the next few weeks. The final valuation could change depending on the price of Bitcoin. And Bloomberg has learned that Hong Kong's Lala Move has filed confidentially for a U.S. IPO. We're told the logistics and delivery firm is looking to raise at least $1 billion in the share sale. Lala Move provides on-demand van hailing and courier services across Asia, Latin America and the U.S. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gipta. This is Bloomberg. There's 
trillions of dollars of assets under management now calling for greater and consistent disclosure around climate risk. And when I've also asked staff to take up uh, disclosures around human capital, the, the most important, really fundamental asset of a company, uh, the people that work there. There's a lot of work to do at the SEC, the 33rd SEC chair. That was Gary Genster there speaking to Bloomberg TV and radio from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Lisa Bramberts and Taylor Riggs, here's the price action, 42.52 on the S&P 500. We advanced 21 points, up a half of 1%. A nice lift this morning, this Thursday, going into some data in America about two hours and 12 minutes away. In the FX market, euro dollar approaching 120 again, 119.45, up a little more than a tenth of 1%. Business confidence out of France out of Germany. Pretty tidy. And yields approaching 150 once more. 149.19 yields up almost the basis point on the day. This bond market not disturbed by what's happening in D.C. Not on the monetary policy side, but on the debt limit. Lisa Taylor, Secretary Yellen coming out swinging in the last 24 hours. Lisa, failing to increase the debt limit would have absolutely catastrophic economic consequences. Secretary Yellen went on to say it would precipitate a financial crisis, it would threaten the jobs and savings of Americans, and at a time when we're still recovering from the COVID pandemic. It seems like pretty harsh words considering that this is usually a formality, right? I mean, isn't this every six months or so there's a debt limit crisis or every year and people wonder whether they're going to raise the limit. They raise the limit at the last minute. People yawn. Is this time different? And I wonder whether that's the case or whether she just wants to get ahead of it and sort of place the blame prematurely on the Republicans. <laughs> Let's bring in Bloomberg government's Jack Fitzpatrick. Jack, as you know, the current suspension of the U.S. debt limit ends July 31st. How seriously should we be taking this? We should definitely be taking this seriously. Uh, the question is how complicated the solution to this could be. The technical deadline is July 31st. Treasury can always bump that back by some amount of time using extraordinary measures. They delay as many payments as they can, that kind of thing. Uh, but we don't know when that actual effective deadline might be. Uh, Secretary Yellen warned that could be in August when lawmakers take a break. Uh, there's an estimate by the Bipartisan Policy Center, which tends to be pretty reliable, saying, no, it's probably going to be later in the fall. So there's not really much of a legislative strategy on this. Uh, and to be honest, I've, I've asked all the lawmakers involved in these kinds of discussions for a couple months now what exactly the plan is on the debt limit. And even as of yesterday, there, there is no plan. Hakeem Jeffries, the House Democratic uh, Caucus chair, said yesterday there really haven't been talks. Uh, the Democrats can do this in a partisan way if Republicans try to use the debt limit as leverage for spending cuts. Uh, but that's through a slower budget reconciliation pro process. Uh, that they haven't really started yet. So the, the deadline and the fact that they don't know exactly when it is uh, it may be challenging for them and some Republican pushback on just a clean debt limit uh, extension, suspension or raise might make things tough uh, as we get closer to August. Jack, this feels like the same story over and over again. And I got to be honest, the T-bill market seems to agree with that. It seems completely unrattled by the prospect of uh, some sort of debt default. So can you give us some insight in the politics behind this, especially at a time when there are no hawks left, where everyone's willing to do deficit spending? Spending. Why isn't there some sort of agreement to sort of kick the can down the road and get some sort of extension here? Yeah, I, I wouldn't uh, say now is the time to panic. The issue, though, is, one, Republicans in Congress don't have that much of an incentive other than just general good governance to go along with a clean debt limit increase. I would also point to the fact that earlier this year, Senate Republicans added a measure to their conference rules, which are non-binding, but essentially a political statement, saying that any increase in the debt limit should be offset by corresponding spending cuts. So if you raise it by $100 billion, that bill also needs to include $100 billion in cuts, which is something that Democrats would not go along with. Uh, so it is at least worth noting that the path to a solution to a, a suspension or a raise of the debt limit is politically complicated right now. And that, yes, Republicans have supported uh, deficit financing measures in the past, but doing that under a Democratic administration with Democrats in control of the House and Senate is much different. And uh, there's, there's some more reticence on the Republican side right now. Jack, how much does this $559 billion bipartisan infrastructure plan fit into the picture here? 
That uh, that's part of a two track approach to the major legislation right now. Uh, the senators who negotiated that are going to meet with the president at some point today to talk about that. Uh, but keep in mind, uh, Democrats want first a bipartisan infrastructure bill and then a more partisan catch all measure that they can do through reconciliation to pass it with a simple majority in the Senate later. Uh, and it's a, a bit of a chicken and an egg uh, situation in which Democrats don't really want to do the bipartisan infrastructure deal unless they know they can get their other priorities in a second deal. Uh, but they may not want to do the second deal unless they can also understand that they can get the bipartisan infrastructure deal. So they're trying to get two things moving at the same time. Uh, and at least as of now, they are moving forward and the, the mood seems relatively positive, uh, at least on that first step. And there are plans for a second bigger bill on the American Families Plan, uh, that kind of thing, the climate stuff, anything that gets pulled out of the infrastructure talks. How are we going to pay for all of this? Uh, the question is if we're going to fully pay for it or if we're, we're not really going to entirely pay for it. Uh, and there may be some kind of gimmicky measures to pay for it involved. Uh, the latest talks on infrastructure are how much money can you actually raise by increasing IRS enforcement. There is a huge delta in terms of how you measure that. It may come out so that the official score that says how much money you raise and, and can use to pay for infrastructure spending is only something like $60 billion, and Democrats may insist, no, in reality, it's greater. Uh, the, the, there are conversations among Democrats right now about a big legislative plan, infrastructure, and their other priorities that is about halfway paid for. Uh, but when we see the details of this uh, infrastructure package, and, and the tax talks have been tough. When we see the details, we'll see if they made it, made it to 100% pay-fors or if it's a bit cut off uh, and there's some sort of political wrangling to claim that it's more paid for than the CBO really says. Jack, thank you. Jack Fitzpatrick there of Bloomberg Government. I thought this was a whole new world, Lisa, where we don't pay for things anymore. I know. That's what I kept saying. Why do people suddenly care about it? And I'm not even being snarky. The reason no, I say this is because from the bond market's perspective, this was meant to be the story we confronted through 21 into 22, and that seems to have changed pretty quickly. The whole idea of modern monetary theory, just print more money and you'll be fine, and seems it seems like it has worked in terms of bond prices not, uh, not declining too much, yields staying pretty tame, and yet the hawks are coming back. People Taylor, care. is this one of the key variables for you? Just the uncertainty for this market, for the outlook, the lack of clarity on the fiscal path. I am dying a slow death, John. Just watching these talks. Somehow you have to pay for it. I mean, eventually, all but the analysts you? say there'll be enough dollar weakness that we finally realize that someone has to pay for it, but not now in wartime, John. I thought you were dying a slow death because it was just boring watching these negotiations <laughs> go on <laughs> and on and on. I hope it's not this show, Taylor. Thank you. <laughs> Coming up, Danny Blanchflower, formerly of the Bank of England, ahead of a BOE decision. This is Bloomberg. From New York City for our audience worldwide, here's the price action this Thursday morning. Equities up 21 on the S&P, a nice advance, 42.52 on the S&P 500, up about a half of 1%. Your all-time high on an intraday basis, 42.57. Look out for that in today's session. Switch up the board and get to the bond market. Two's 10s, 30s. At the front end, elevated. We have a heartbeat in the chart of a two-year yield. Lisa's been running you through that over the last week. Right now, about 26 basis points. We drift just a little bit higher again. The likes of Bostick talking about a hike in 22. The likes of Kaplan talking about a hike in 22. It's not my view. I don't have one. I'm sure you do. We'll talk about that in a moment. <laughs> Your 10-year yield, 149. Yields unchanged on a 10-year, on a 30-year, basically unchanged as well. Lisa went through some of the supply. We'll get some seven-year debt a little bit later from the Treasury. That's the bond market. Let's finish on this in the FX market. We've had some decent data out of Europe. The PMIs were strong. Business confidence out of France, out of Germany, also pretty strong, pretty decent. Widely expected, just in terms of the trajectory, you expected to get better. And the moves in foreign exchange, I've got to say, Lisa, they've been pretty muted. Euro dollar one nineteen forty six, up almost two tenths of one percent. Even with that decent data, it's just shrug of the shoulders as you were. 
Pretty Muted pretty much sums up it all. It's or a summer boring. Thursday, isn't it? <laughs> it's so boring it out there. what it feels like. You were at dollar one nineteen forty six. Taylor Riggs falling asleep. What does she call it? Death. Slow death. Slow death. She's Thanks dying a slow death. A slow death. We all are. Lisa, we're done. <laughs> yeah, we're done. I will just say, you mentioned the Fed speak and how nobody seems to care. Sven Henrik on Twitter put out this comment. I think we should just move to 24 Fed speakers a day, every hour of the day, to keep us updated on progress. The more they say, the less they actually say. Danny Blanchflower, Dartmouth professor of economics uh, and former Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee Hi, member, old. joining us now. We were just talking about how there is not much being said that is new. How However, we may hear something in a half hour time from the Bank of England when they release their rate decision. You're looking for a potential policy error. Can you explain? Well, both the Fed and the Bank of England are struggling in the dark. Uh, we've never seen anything like this. And the best thing is to simply wait and see. Um, so any, any suggestion that they have a clue, I mean, people say things like, I think we're going to tighten in 2022 and 2023. Well, they're just kind of winging it. I think that the potential error here at the bank is to say that they're going to start to perhaps um, do less QE, uh, stop, sort of stop it by August rather than December. Um, as the economy goes into lockdown, um, the, the, the data really are very confusing. So I think the sensible thing for them to do is to say, we're continuing, we're waiting, and we're watching. Two, two people are going to leave the committee. Hal Dane, this is his last meeting. Um, Flige leaves in August and we get Catherine Mann. So I think the right thing to do is to just say waiting, watching, and, 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 and signaling that they have a clue what they're going to do in the future, I think would be a major error. Well, uh, Danny, I got to think that all of people, all of the discussion that we hear out of Fed officials, out of Bank of England officials, basically gets shrugged off by markets because until Fair, uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell speaks, no one's going to listen. Basically, he's going to lead the charge yeah. globally when it comes to tightening. And until he does so, you know, these members on different central banks can say whatever they want. No one will believe them. Isn't that the case? Well, I, th I think that's right. And I think in many senses, Jay Powell and I both sound the same. He's been very sensible. Um, what did I just say? Waiting and watching, understanding they made a mistake in 2015 and accepted that, and saying, you know, we'll, we'll see how the economy moves. I mean, we've still got to understand what happens in the, with the vaccine and what happens in the, in the southern states in the United States, of course. But then there's all these issues about which firms are going to survive and are people going to change their long-run behavior? And that's a risk to the downside. Are people going to keep those savings that they have and not, not spend them? We don't know, but the risks, I think, are to the downside. So if you go back to making the potential error, People saying, oh, we need to worry about inflation. Well, what inflation? So the, the, the talk today is the Bank of England worries about inflation. Well, it's 2.1, and we've had two very weird months where the base effect has dominated, and the slight changes in the last couple of months go away in 12 months' time. So everything looks to be transitory and temporary, and the answer is we just don't know. And Jay Powell has been, I think, fantastic, and he's just been saying essentially that. Wait, look. Uh, and we'll respond if we need to. But there ain't no inflation problem, despite the fact 2.1, and that's supposed to be an inflation problem with a weird couple of months. Come on, folks, get real. Danny, do you think we're suffering from a bit of groupthink? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, so I, the, the groupthink, in a way, though, if, if you follow Powell, is to be right. But I hear these, these Fed governors, I hear Haldane at the bank being, making ludicrous claims saying inflation's going to take off. Based upon what? Wild, wishful thinking and guessing. That's not credible for a central bank. Danny, that dissent's healthy, isn't it? Even if they disagree with you. Of course it is. It's healthy well, to have that. And I think healthy. what I've missed over the last 10 years, is particularly <laughs> with the Bank of England, since Governor Carney came out with some forward guidance right. that, let's face it, didn't work. But one thing right. he said off the back of that forward guidance is that it helped to tie the hands of the committee because you got everyone to agree with one thing <laughs> well, and no one could dissent anymore. John, John the, the, you and I were just chatting on this. If you look, if you look at the Fed... Not a single governor since Greenspan has ever dissented. Governors at the Bank of England have actually not dissented, although Haldane, as chief economist, has. Um, I think a real debate is, is credible and sensible. But I think if you, if you realise that we just don't know, remember we saw the biggest drop in output ever seen, biggest and fastest drop in output ever seen. And the question is, what's the past data? Well, we have past data from the 1918 Great Influenza, 
Um, and we've had, you know, so, so there's, there's really not much to go by. Um, so, yeah, you're right, dissent's quite good, but, but in a sense, much of the dissent we've actually seen over the last decade has been dissent in error. The, 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 the reality is that people have argued that you should have raised rates and you've dissented on that side, and it's clear over the last decade every one of those votes was in error. You shouldn't have done that. Big picture, Danny, a lot of the notes that I've read, the push for wage pressures, a focus on human capital, a right. shift to ESG, those are structurally inflationary. Are we in a new inflationary regime? Well, the answer the answer is go and read the blog written by CeCe Rouse, the, 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 the chair of the CEA, talks about actually the likelihood is that the wage data are really are messed up. And reality is very soon we're going to see negative wage growth. I've got two nice indicators for the UK, how hard it is to understand wage growth. The official data came out this week on wage growth, 8.4%. But we've just had data this morning on the size of wage settlements, two. Um, and so what you have are these base effects and composition effects. It's very hard to understand what's going on. But in wage terms, we've seen the bottom of the wage distribution drop out. Mm -hmm. And so we're comparing to a weird thing from a year ago. Um, and so I think the evidence is actually that, um, yeah, there are going to be some bottlenecks, but that's not something you want to respond to instantly. That's, so I, I think that the, the wage pressure we will see. But I think a lot of it is, you know, the world is changing a bit. How many more data points would it take for you to see? Three, four? Um, I don't know. Um, I want to see evidence that significant bottlenecks are occurring, and I don't see that in the data. I'm not going to say three or four. I would want to see sustained evidence. But I think the wage settlement evidence is pretty good. 2%, same as it's been for the last decade. It's been two, 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 two. Yes, there are temporary bottlenecks. But what should the central bank do to respond to a temporary bottleneck? Think of price changes. We saw a big rise in timber prices. OK, people don't have to buy timber. And so the price of timber now is halved. So we, I think we'll, we, we just have to watch an economy recovering from a shock we've never seen before. Danny, just to conclude things, someone wrote into me just moments ago, and I think you'd agree with them. The only mistake has been to be too hawkish, never too dovish. That's been true over the last 10 years. Is that what you worry about now? <laughs> I think that's right. I mean, I don't understand how, how is it an error to sit and wait and watch. Just wait. Don't 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 do anything more than you're doing now, and watch as the economy resolves itself. Look 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 at the hawkish folk who I've been on your programs with many times over the last decade, telling us inflation was going to take off. That's what it was going to do. You had to raise rent. All of that was nonsense. <laughs> so I think the the error has always been in in a recovery. You tighten too quickly. There's no, there's really no error to be had in waiting and looking and seeing. And I think that's what's going to, and we're going to see in the UK, the potential is the government is going to withdraw the stimulus, perhaps in September. In the, U, in the US, these unemployment benefits are going to go away. And then we'll see. We'll see what the, how the economy bounces back. But, you know, wait, look, watch, and don't make another big mistakes like George Osborne did in the UK in 2010. Danny, we, need a, we need a round table, don't we, with you and Andrew Sentence. Yeah. We need to do that again. Oh, no. Should we get Sentence back. <laughs> like the no. good old days. I no. think we're friends now. We are good friends. We both think Brexit is a disaster. There we go. You agree on <laughs> something. He still wants to raise rates, of course. Does he? Well, that's yeah, what I thought. Does. Maybe that would be the optimal round table for a programme. No, like the, what's the discussion? The discussion the is that you want low rates forever and... Wrong. He wants higher rates. Danny, it's good to see you. It's good to hear from you. Danny Blanchard, Dartmouth Professor of Economics. Up again. I'm of trying. <laughs> and former Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee member. Lisa, do you know that the two of them, when they're on the MPC, they fell out afterwards and we did this nice kumbaya get together. They made friends on my show many years ago after the UK voted to leave the European Union. That's the one thing they could agree on yeah, and you in want the to last bring them on. 15 years. You want to bring them on to disagree. On rates, on rates specifically. Yeah, you want, you want them to disagree because you want some good dissent. You also want some drama because this is a boring market and there are no hawks left and there is a question of whether this is the right approach or whether there should be perhaps a, a little bit more pushback. Did you see this uh, paper that the ECB analyst put out about how low inflation expectations 
breeds now, the low one in, the inflation. The one in Kit Duke's note this morning. Yeah. Kit's note over at Sokgen. I saw that, yeah. Yeah, I thought it was interesting, sort of the whole idea of Japanification. And it sort of brings this cycle in the forefront of central bankers' minds. If they say that inflation's going to stay low, does that keep inflation low? Mm. How much can they kind oh, of so they should push commit to making a policy mistake. They should say... <laughs> I'm trying to stir be, something up for you. Too high. <laughs> no, What's wrong with the both of you? Taylor Riggs, Lisa Brown is bored this morning. Equities might print an all-time high later in the session. Taylor, what does that tell you, that we could have record highs and you're both bored of it? M2 money supply, right? All the money, John, sloshing around. We were having great conversations this morning of not only the monetary effects, but the fiscal <sighs> effects as well. And it is unbelievable. The NASDAQ 100 at a record high and sort of a hint of that defensiveness underneath the surface and the resiliency of these markets to shrug off any of those inflationary concerns. How many record highs can you have before you shrug it off? This is going to be, what, the 13th? This is another one. <laughs> talk about the pandemic a little bit later as well. Dr. Gigi Granville, Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security Senior Scholar. We'll do that later. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. With the First Word News, I'm Rishka Gupta. President Biden is traveling to North Carolina today to encourage more Americans to get the COVID-19 vaccine. His trip to Riley comes 10 days before July 4th. The president stated target date to see at least 70% of adult Americans at least partially vaccinated. The CDC says that so far, slightly more than 65% of U.S. adults have had at least one dose. China has filed a lawsuit against Australia at the World Trade Organization over anti-dumping measures on some Chinese goods. The measures in question target Chinese products, including wind towers and stainless steel sinks. Earlier this week, Australia said it would appeal duties imposed by China on its wine exports. And the world's biggest maker of Bitcoin mining rigs is suspending sales of machines for spot delivery, hoping to prop up prices. Bitmain Technologies says it has stopped selling new equipment after prices for top-tier rigs plunged by about 75% since April. China's crackdown on crypto mining is causing miners to abandon their operations and dump machines on the market. And Siemens has raised its financial targets and announced its first share buyback since 2015. The German industrial giant will buy back as much as nearly $3.6 billion of shares over a five-year period starting next year. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 mark countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We don't have plans to close full offices and tell people to work from home, no. We want people to come into the office. With the vaccination rate uh, uh, as high as it is now and the measures that people have taken, while clearly COVID-19, you know, it looks like there's gonna be a, um, another wave, um, but uh, hopefully that doesn't translate into hospitalizations or uh, um, or more serious illness. That was Jess Staley, the Barclays CEO from New York City this morning. Good morning. Tom Keane taking a long weekend alongside me, Lisa Bramitz, as always, and Taylor Riggs as well. It's the price action this Thursday morning, shaping up as follows on the S&P 500, 42.52. We advance 21 points. We're higher, firmer, stronger by a half of 1%. Yields are higher, too, by a single basis point on a 10-year to 149.36. In the FX market, euro stronger. Off the back of some pretty decent confidence data out of the two largest economies in the eurozone, France and Germany. Euro dollar 119.4. 46, advancing their two-tenths of 1%. The bank CEOs, Lisa, they are not holding back. <laughs> Jess Staley, we don't have plans to close the offices. We want people to come into the office. He's pretty clear about that. Come into the office, but you need to get vaccinated if you do. That is Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan, not far behind. And it really is showing how the private sector is leading the way when it comes to vaccination policy at this point. Get it done and get back to work. Taylor Riggs, the thing's pretty clear going deeper into summer, isn't it? 
A hundred percent clear, John. And I think that this has been sort of the big debate on Wall Street, of course, not only within New York City, but global Wall Street, as we think about how the private sector takes back uh, perhaps maybe some of those big decisions, uh, John. It so we think about how to get an economy reopened. Yeah, Taylor, you say global Wall Street, though, Lisa, it's been pretty clear, with maybe the exception of Barclays and Jess Staley, that the European banks are taking a slightly subtly different way of thinking about this. Yeah, it's that they see that working from home really works and also that it might maybe save money. Just a little bit on floor <laughs> space, might be part on of office it. space, maybe. Dr Gigi Gronville joins us now, Johns Hopkins Centre for House Security Senior Scholar. Dr, great to catch up. Chancellor Merkel speaking in the last couple of moments. Here's the headline. We're worried about the COVID-19 Delta variant. Doctor, why should we be worried about the COVID-19 Delta variant? Yes, the Delta variant looks like it's a little more transmissible than some of the variants we've dealt with before. But thank goodness, it's still the vaccines are protective. So if you haven't gotten vaccinated, this is the, ch the chance. This is your opportunity to get immunity before you get exposed, because it's looking like you will be exposed to this virus. So um, don't delay. So, Dr. Granville, what's the logic of places like Israel closing or perhaps delaying the reopening to foreign uh, visitors because of the Delta variant, because 100 people uh, got diagnosed with COVID, given the fact that people are not getting hospitalized? And frankly, these vaccinations are protective against the variant. Yeah, well, not everybody is able to respond to the vaccine in the same way. And perhaps, um, you know, you don't want to take that risk. Um, there are still maybe children who haven't been vaccinated. So um, it's, it's taking an opportunity that maybe could have been taken early in the pandemic to try and limit the import of infections um, if you had the ability to test and to, to do contact tracing. And this is coming at a time uh, when Germany's uh, Angela Merkel is saying that there needs to be more coordination between the European region in terms of the travel guidelines. What's the threshold in your mind in terms of vaccination rates, in terms of hospitalizations, where we can get a sort of more consistent protocol globally in terms of travel, in terms of testing, in terms of quarantining? Yeah, I think you're not going to get a good answer about that, except that um, that it's that's not enough what we have right now. Um, the, there's still a lot of problems with access to vaccine, and so um, we need to make sure that the people who are most vulnerable and the people who are interacting with others and transmitting it to each other that they are also prioritized for vaccination because it's a lot of the younger people that are transmitting these these variants. Doctor, I'm curious how you respond to people who say you look at countries like the UK and Israel with the best vaccination rates, and yet they can't reopen their economy because, to Lisa's point, you see a rise in infections, sometimes asymptomatic cases. Some people say that sort of undermines the confidence in the vaccines. How do you respond? Um, well, two doses are better than one, and so that's part of the problem with the UK, that um, there are still a lot of people who haven't had their second dose. Um, so I think, um, you know, I don't, I don't know what to say to that, except that uh, for you personally and your family, you will be better protected if you have both doses of the vaccine. And there is even some discussion now um, about whether or not people who are particularly vulnerable, who have had the one-shot J&J vaccine, whether they might uh, consider topping it off with a, with, a, um, with a second shot, because the second shot seems to be, um, you know, uh, more protective. Do you see a time in the near future, similarly to the flu 100 years ago, where we just learn to live with the virus? Well, we're not going to eradicate this virus. Uh, any thought that um, that we're going to be able to take this away from the planet is um, that's just not going to happen. It took a lot of effort, and it was very particular conditions to eradicate smallpox from from uh, the planet. And uh, we're not going to be able to replicate that here, especially because this virus can also infect a lot of different animals. Um, so we are going to live with it, but let's you know learn to live with it with a high vaccination rate and uh, high testing, um, we can do that and we can certainly limit uh, severe disease. Doctor, we've got to leave it there. Thank you. Dr. Gigi Gromville there, the Johns Hopkins Centre for Health Security Senior Scholar. Got a case study playing out in real time in the UK right now with this mm -hmm. Delta variant, Lisa, and we have a country that has got, I believe, 60% of the adult population with two doses of a vaccine now. So how this plays out is going to be pretty key. And the fact that younger people are the ones that are getting sick, but they're not dying. They are getting hospitalized, but you're not seeing the hospitals overrun. So at what point does this 
has become, uh, as you've mentioned many times, the onus on the individual to protect themselves and, frankly, to have uh, protection for the rest of society and, and, frankly, just get back to life for those who are vaccinated. They're going to be fine. When a personal decision no longer threatens the healthcare system more broadly, are we at that point right now, Lisa? I guess that's the open question. That's the open question, especially because, to Gigi's point, Dr. Granville's point, there are places that still don't have that many uh, vaccines, so they might be less available in terms of uh, access and also younger individuals, right? I mean, younger kids who might not be as vulnerable. However, uh, if they're not vaccinated or even eligible, do we really want to enter into that, uh, that shift? I've got to say, for New York City, Taylor, with the exception of going on public transport, getting in an Uber or a cab and wearing a mask, Things are pretty much getting back there, aren't mm -hmm. they? John, you know what I thought about the other day? It What's was like that? a year ago. I was on the open and I made a joke about how traffic seemed to be back. I take that back. Two days ago, traffic was more back than it was, it was a year ago. <laughs> I've got to say, Backer. going into the weekend, it is very, very busy in New York City. It's the New York tourism, the domestic tourism. Lisa, do you think that's what Mr. Gorman and Morgan Stanley's made his point about? That if you can return to New York to go to a restaurant, we want you back in the office. Yeah, basically they're saying if you can have a normal life elsewhere, why not have a normal life coming back to the office? I think the distinction here is whether people will want to work from home, whether there is a generational shift where younger people say, look, why should we come into the office if we can do our jobs just as well? And so I think that the proof now goes beyond the pandemic and goes to a quality of life, a style of life in terms of efficacy. And that's going to be the divide. And maybe an older gentleman who wants a longer weekend just to have a stroll around Manhattan, have a cigar without a mask on. Who am I Tangy. talking about? Tangy Who Mimosa. am I talking about? <laughs> He'll be back with us on yeah. Monday. Equity Futures, 42.52. We advise a half of 1%. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg. I'm not surprised also to hear the language of Fed Chair Jay Powell. They're committed to going at this gradually. I think more surprising in the market was hearing taper talk start. What they don't want to do is take a dramatic and drastic action to really result in a sharp shift. Whether it's fiscally or consumption, there's really no cliff out there that we see right now. Of course the economy is experiencing some frictions. We rebooted the global economy. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lee. Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Tom Keane is out of the building alongside me, Lisa Abramowitz and Taylor Riggs. Looking at the equity market right now, 42.52 on the S&P. We advanced 21 points on the S&P 500. Sterling comes in just a little bit. Now negative on the day at 139.55 with a Bank of England rate decision. Lisa Abramowitz, what's the detail that you see right now? Just that it's no drama, right? That basically there was no rate decision. Uh, they voted unanimously. Unanimously to speak to your point about very little dissent to maintain benchmark interest rates and that they hold government asset purchase plan at $875 billion. Pounds. Uh, so basically, no change, no indication of tightening. We'll have to wait to see and parse through the details to see whether there was any more hawkish decision. But you could see uh, yields falling here as people uh, weigh this as them remaining as dovish as they can be. And a parting dissent from the chief economist Andy Haldane largely anticipated that's the result of all of this voting to reduce the asset purchase target, the asset purchase target, the guilt purchase target right now, 875 billion in its entirety. Sterling down to 139.42. Taylor, we've got to try and get you excited about the day ahead of all-time highs on the cards, maybe on the S&P 500. You're not going to let me live that down, John. Certainly interesting day. The resiliency of these markets to shrug off some of the inflationary, perhaps some of the more hawkish tones that we get. Raphael Bostic, uh, uh, Mr. Bostic, of course, from the Atlanta Fed, really striking that tone, John, yesterday, hinting that he's looking at a taper maybe in three to four months. That sets us up nicely for Jackson Hole September and perhaps maybe some of the divergence or not between the individual central banks as equity markets say, all right, we're in it and we're going higher. And everyone else just shrugs their shoulders as we looked down the path towards another all-time highs. The Bank of England right now, we will not tighten until there is clear evidence of progress towards our goal. Lisa, 139.28 now on sterling against the US dollar. We're down about a quarter of 1% there. Yeah, although they did say the downside economic risks have been reduced. However, everyone seems to be saying this as we end up heading uh, toward uh, some sort of recovery. That said, 
the balance of the decision making at this point is to the more dovish side. And I think that that is clear from each central bank meeting that we hear. Frankly, it's going to have to be Fed Chair Jay Powell that changes the tone. Let's turn to the price action. 42.51 on the S&P 500. Equity futures drifting higher this Thursday morning. We advance a half of 1%. Cable, negative on the day. That's a weaker pound, down by a quarter of 1% against the US dollar. Sterling, 139.26. Euro dollar, 119.41, advancing a little more than a tenth of 1%. And yields basically unchanged on a 10-year at 148.68. Lisa, unchanged on a 10-year after all of the surprise and action after the past week. Yeah, a thrilling day. Honestly, though, this is telling because the fact that you have all of these Fed officials coming out and saying actually these inflationary pressures could be significant. The fact that you're not getting any move today is significant that people are shrugging that off. I will just say if you're playing the drinking game, the Bank of England coming out and saying the T word transitory when it comes to inflationary pressures. My question is, if we have such a robust recovery, if we have such a tight labor market, why is it that we're still getting uh, nearly 400,000 Americans filing? for unemployment benefits each week. Today, we're expecting less than 400,000 for the first time since the peak of the pandemic. However, still a high 380,000. The question that I have is how much progress is being made? How can we dismiss these data points as just noisy versus actually telling in terms of the composition of which jobs are coming back? Are we at a services recovery yet? Also getting the first quarter GDP, the third read of that. 1 p.m., the U.S. is selling $62 billion of seven-year notes. Perhaps there will be drama here. It does not seem like, though, that is the case based on the recent auctions that we got. Yesterday's five-year sale uh, went pretty well. And then 4.30 p.m., the Federal Reserve re released the results of the stress test. All six biggest U.S. banks are expected to pass with flying colors, expected to double their dividend payments and their uh, stock buybacks. The question that I have really is the market question of how people will trade this. Basically, is it baked in or do people see this as a point of uh, profitability going forward? Forward. Have banks become the new utilities, John, in terms of just yes. generating cash and, and being a reliable bet rather than a more fickle one that fluctuates on trading volumes? That has been a theme for many years now, hasn't it? Lisa, thank you. Let's turn to Luke Cower, UBS Asset Management Asset Allocation Strategist. Mr. Cower, good to see you. A good old friend. Luke, as here, you John. know, central banks, when they change, they take baby steps. And the baby step that I think we're witnessing over the past week, both with the Federal Reserve and now with the Bank of England, seems to be just reassessing the balance of risks around the outlook and also around the outlook for inflation. What's your take on that, Luke? Well, John, imagine if your, your baby's first step wasn't a first step, if it was, you know, a pole vault or a high jump. That's, that's the shock kind of the market had to deal with, even though we're talking about things that were only out, you know, in 2023 and do require a lot of, uh, of progress to be sustained and to be actually realized. So in, in kind of looking at the Fed and digesting how uh, that might hit cross-asset action, uh, what we're thinking about is kind of the two reasons why uh, Chairman Powell said that the dots did move up. One reason is that you know, economic activity is coming in, so there's more confidence within the Fed that the baseline outlook that they achieved in March, that they outlined in March, is going to be achieved. So on the one hand, this suggests that continued inline data is going to be a force of pressure that continues to pull forward dots. And if you're, you're trading short-term interest rates, all you have to do is be more confident than the Fed that that economic outlook is going to be achieved. You can kind of continue to push the timeline on that front. Uh, on the other hand, it's clear that the, the inflation risk, the balance of inflation risk, that jumping to a net 13 Fed officials thinking that the, the risk to uh, to a core PC are tilted to the upside, that also influences the forecast, the balance of risks, and when they think tightening might be warranted. So on the other hand, you have what we would expect to see uh, over time is that the ebbing of these inflationary pressures and upside risks, just as these, these do turn to be uh, less persistent to avoid using the T word, inflationary forces. So kind of putting this together, oh, I think what you would expect coming out of the FOMC, and this is something we've adjusted to take account of, is that that real yields break evens trade-off ha has moved more into the, the real yield side of it driving uh, moves in the 10 year. Uh, that, of course, is going to also have an effect on the dollar. So it's about seeing less widespread dollar weakness and uh, the, the scope for that uh, deteriorating on the margin. What I will say is encouraging to say from a risk perspective is that even as we've had you know, a, a broad dollar rebound in the wake of the FOMC, it's rallying more against the DXY components than it is against the EMFX components. So this suggests this isn't about a kind of a dumping of risk currencies, so to speak, or a less positive view on risk. It's just a reevaluation 
valuation of the Fed, real yields, and what that means at the front end. So, Luke, the more we hear the T word, transitory, the more people buy risk assets. Exactly as you said, they're going further into uh, risk in order to get returns. There is a question at what point the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, other central banks start to take action just to curtail uh, some of the moves that we've seen. And I'm thinking of the mortgage market in particular. To Taylor's point earlier, this question of the composition of which uh, assets the Fed may pair back on its purchases. How much are you looking to the mortgage market to feel some pain from that as people start to question the elevated housing prices? Well, I, I think the, the main reason why the, the Fed at this point is still purchasing in both asset classes is because it knows, as we know, that by purchasing MBS, it's, it's sucking treasury ball out of the market. And, uh, you know, what, one of the Fed's goals is to, you know, uh, use asset purchases to a certain extent to, to calm markets, calm market volatility. So I, I think the, the signal from the Fed that it's going in either direction in terms of both purchasing less and moving to, uh, to raise rates at some Undust and at some uh, inconclusive point in the future is, is really just a signal they will both be that the Fed is moving more from a, a vol suppressant mode, a purely vol suppressant mode, in order to get us through the crisis and get the rebound completely on track to one where the Fed is going to be more a source of, of two way volatility. I think that's the real read in from that, not necessarily the nature of uh, the, the components of the underlying asset purchases. Luke, are you surprised by the cross asset resiliency with equities at record highs, a VIX with a 15 handle and a very calm and well-behaved bond market? To a, to a certain extent, yes. I, I think the, the markets have been able to digest this quite well, uh, the, a more hawkish than expected Fed. And I, I think kind of when we're looking through what and why, uh, what we talked about earlier in terms of the, the dollar being stronger, real yields being stronger, how far can that filter out? What's very important lately is that it hasn't filtered out really all the way to commodities. Copper had a, had a pretty bad move down, but that's kind of alleviated lately. Oil still pushing forward to new highs. So the market is still trading this idea of we're, we're still getting very, very good activity going forward. The Fed has cut off right tail inflation outcomes. Therefore, it's it's safe to buy equities. In our view, there are, there are limits to this, uh, particularly the way that it's been uh, kind of playing out under the surface with uh, with the rotation to growth. That's not necessarily something we want to chase right now. Right now, the equity is at the headline level. We do think are, are due for a breather. And if you look at over the past few months, uh, equities have really moved sideways uh, on a global basis and on the S&P 500. So uh, we're not necessarily looking for a lot of downside, but think there, there will be an attractive dip potentially to buy going forward in the coming weeks. And this is just to do with uh, the market needing to digest that the second derivative is turning, the Fed is becoming less supportive. Luke, always great to catch up. I promised you we wouldn't talk baseball, we won't. Has UBS got a call on Euro 2020? Have you got a country, a nation? I, I, I mean, I, I have to say the Swiss, right? The Swiss. Do you? I guess, maybe. <laughs> Why do you have to say the Swiss? UBS, I guess. It's really? The house view, right? You've got to go the with, house view? You've got to go with Swiss. Switzerland. UBS Asset Management, Asset Allocation Strategist, Luke Cower. Luke's become so corporate. I was about to say the exact same us. thing. He's really? He's so corporate. He would never say I know. the New York team. So just pick a side. Is that Seriously. long hair corporate? <laughs> Not sure, to be honest with you. You used to be very strict over at UBS, Taylor. What you could wear, what you couldn't wear kind of styling you might need. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go to a headline for the Bank of England. This is how you say goodbye to your dissenting chief economist. It's wrong to undermine the recovery with premature tightening. Lisa, that's the headline coming out of the Bank of England this morning. Saying goodbye to the last dissenter. I think a lot Farewell. of people thought that he was, uh, uh, you know, don't let the door hit you on the way out. People thought that he was a little bit on the fringe. That said, how much is it actually healthy uh, to have that fringe view? I don't know. You think you I think dissent that. is good. Yeah. Andy, Han Andy Haldane goes over to a think tank now and writes some provocative pieces, maybe. For Project Syndicate. Gets you thinking for whoever. Coming up at 8 a.m., Peter Chir, Academy Securities, head of macro strategy. Looking forward to that conversation with Pete in about 50 minutes from now. Equities up 21 on the S&P, 42, 53 almost, up a half of 1%. From New York City, heard on Bloomberg Radio, seen on Bloomberg TV. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. U.S. officials are confirming that details of the genetic makeup of some of the earliest samples 
of coronavirus in China were removed from an American database where they were initially stored at the request of Chinese researchers. The U.S. National Institutes of Health says that the data first submitted to the U.S.-based sequence read archive in March 2020 were requested to be withdrawn by the same researcher three months later. The Vietnamese government plans to administer 300,000 to 500,000 COVID-19 vaccinations a day in the next six months, according to a post on the government's website. The ministries of health and defense are said to be close to completing warehouses capable of storing vaccines at extremely cold temperatures in seven locations across the country. And bullish, a cryptocurrency exchange backed by a group of billionaires, including Peter Thiel, is in SPAC merger talks with Far Peak Acquisition, Bloomberg's learned. The deal could value bullish at nearly $12 billion with an agreement possible in the next few weeks. The final valuation could change depending on the price of Bitcoin. And John McAfee has been found dead in a Spanish prison cell. Shortly after it was announced, he would be extradited to the U.S., to face charges of financial crimes, the creator of the McAfee antivirus software has been jailed in Spain on U.S. tax evasion charges. A Spanish newspaper has reported that he appeared to have taken his own life. He was 75 years old. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritsuki Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I'm not surprised also to hear the language of Fed Chair Jay Powell. They, they're committed to going at this gradually. The real unemployment rate is still elevated. The bond market is not signaling substantial inflation. And so this is going to be a gradual process. As you were in the bond market, that was Brian Levitt, the Invesco Global Market Strategist. Tom Keane out of the building with me, Lisa Bravitz, Taylor Riggs. I'm Jonathan Farrow. It's the price action this Thursday. Equity futures 42.51 up 20. We advance a half of 1%. In the FX market, euro dollar 119.44. Yields unchanged at 148.51 on a US 10 year. If you switch up the board and get to the FX market, sterling is what I want to look at. Cable with a leg lower. That's a weaker pound against the US dollar. 139.23. That's a weaker pound, Lisa, as the Bank of England pushes back against any chance of a hawkish pivot a la the Federal Reserve anytime soon. I think the Fed's going to have to move first, and that's the message that we're getting from central bank after central bank. I mean, honestly, at what point is this just going to be a race to the bottom continually, even as we see uh, inflation pick up? Do you remember that race back in 2014 between the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve? Who would hike first? Yeah. Going to be waiting a number of years, maybe, for even the Fed to make that move. Honestly, at this point, it's the move of indicating that they're going to slow the purchases. That's first. And frankly, that will be a hawkish shock. What did Luke Kawa say? What if the first step was a first leap? That's yeah, if considered this, a leap. I called it a baby step. Yeah. And he said, imagine if your baby's <laughs> first move was a somersault or something like that. <laughs> Thank you, Luke Kawa. Josh Wingrove joining us now. Bloomberg White House reporter down in D.C. Josh, always great to catch up, sir. Let's just Morning. start with following the infrastructure talks. I've been told it's days and not weeks. We've got to get it done. Otherwise, we're going alone. And then I was told the same thing three weeks after I left the building. What's going on, Josh? Yeah, they seem to have reached near the, the sort of cusp of a deal or an actual deal last night. A couple of senators coming out calling it a quote-unquote framework. Others saying, well, we're not quite there yet. But they did get the sort of golden ticket, which is a meeting with Biden himself today at the White House. The White House said they wouldn't do that unless there was progress. The top line numbers kind of depend on who you ask right now. But it looks like something on the order of $559 billion in new spending. There's ways that they can sort of muck that up by stretching the timeline and including stuff that would have been spent anyway to push it over a trillion and call it a win. Democrats in the House, though, are signaling that, for them, the reconciliation process is part of this deal. In other words, stuff they did not get in this can maybe get rolled into reconciliation. So with regards to a bipartisan infrastructure deal, this is sort of like you know letting the least popular person at the table order the appetizers because you know that you still like, get to order the main course. Well, Josh, that's exactly what I was going to go to, the idea here of isn't this a loss for the Democrats, giving the Republicans the upper hand, that $1.9 to $1.2 trillion to now $559 billion infrastructure plan, continuing to ratchet down while the prospects of further plans getting passed kind of start to wane? I, yeah, I mean, they wanted more for sure. Uh, Republicans will definitely hold this up 
uh, as a win. Democrats are frustrated, of course, particularly the progressive wing are frustrated. But there is that still shoe to drop. Now, re reconciliation for those of you know, the sane viewers who are not following the vagaries of Senate parliamentary procedure, there's a lot of big question marks on it. A, we don't know what all 50 Democrats in the Senate will support, Joe Manchin, uh, Kristen Sinema, et cetera. B, we don't know what can go in reconciliation. It's always sort of up in the air. You will call that they, uh, the $15 minimum wage went over the, uh, the, the, the side of the ship when they realized that that would be sort of out of bounds. So Democrats have this sort of second uh, bullet to fire, if you will, uh, but they don't know yet what can what they can put in it. Uh, remember, he's got that whole third plan as well, the family's plan. They kind of want to do all of that through reconciliation. That yeah. might go to the fall. Maybe, you know, it's it's a lot of moving parts here right now. But Biden is trying to have this sort of smaller deal that Republicans can support. Incidentally, we don't, you know, just because 10 Republicans support it doesn't mean 60 senators do. Uh, and then try to get something enough on reconciliation that uh, progressives don't sort of lose their mind and, you know, accuse them of selling out to the Republicans. Josh, one reason why it's always great to speak with you is because you walk through the halls of Capitol Hill uh, and you find out where the balance of energy is. Is it all an in infrastructure? Is basically the pandemic over and no one's talking about it, even though in the rest of the world there still is a, a lot of cases and a lot of concern about getting uh, vaccinations? I mean, yeah, infrastructure and other things, you know, the pandemic has definitely gone down the list. Uh, you know, w one thing that we're going to see Joe Biden do today is go to North Carolina to try to essentially beg people to get shots. We really have two Americas right now where higher vaccination rates in some states are, you know, in stark contrast to lower vaccination rates in other states, in particular through the U.S. South, that Delta variant is starting to spread. And Biden is kind of torn on his messaging, right? He wants to do this July 4th celebration at the White House. They're going to have a thousand people, Independence Day from the virus. Uh, you know, depending on where you live in the U.S., this thing is very much over or it's very much not. And the problem is that a lot of folks where it's not over tend to be the ones that most likely to believe it is over and they're not getting the vaccine. So in Congress and the White House, this is a balancing act. Biden wants to talk about reopening. He wants to talk about all the shots they've given. 150 million people in the U.S. have had both shots. That's you know, a staggering number as compared to, you know, a few months ago. But my gosh, it, uh, this thing is still roiling out there, in particular that Delta variant. Josh, forgive me if I circle back to some of the infrastructure conversations as we try to round this conversation out. And how are we thinking at this moment of defining what infrastructure is and what it isn't? I mean, it's definitely getting more to bricks and mortar. Uh, this was sort of the early animating discussion. Joe Biden, you know, takes a broader view of it. They think that anything that facilitates people entering the workforce can be, you know, considered infrastructure, including things like the caregiving economy and whatnot. Some of that did get pushed into the third bill, which means it wasn't necessarily on the table for these conversations. What we're talking about now is a little more sort of, you know, uh, sort of core, what you might call core infrastructure. Uh, and again, 550 billion over, uh, you know, a, sh a shorter time frame. They'll probably call it over a trillion over 10 years when you roll in stuff that was sort of on auto spend anyway. Um, you know, there's there's consensus that this is needed, but we'll see. One of the changes that they've done is sort of raid money from COVID aid for uh, around telecoms. So, you know, that doesn't sound like people that are that five alarm desperate to add uh, add more infrastructure funding to the pot. Hey, Josh, it's good to see you. Josh Wingrove, thank, thank you. Good and good luck. My Thanks. good friend, Anne-Marie Horder, and joining the team down in D.C. That is a big dose of New York down in Washington. You'll be OK, Josh. Josh Wingrove down in D.C. looking a little bit worried about how much New York has just gone down to oh, D.C. As Anne-Marie Horder bad. joins the team. Just Anne-Marie's style of New York down in Washington. Do you think they can take that? Of course they we'll can. See. I mean, come we'll on. See. You think we'll that there's such lightweights down in Washington, D.C.? I D. think C? they're lightweights compared to what takes York. place up here, don't you? <laughs> Well, I mean, the oh gloves come goodness. off here. Sit I mean, if you fence. ride the subway, honestly, Sit I think it's a different kind of gloves coming off in Washington, D.C. than here. Waking up at 8.30 compared to getting up at 6. It's a different I'm, world. Come on. I'm still trying to recall the governor and replace it with the movie star, you guys. There you go. Thank <laughs> honestly, you, Taylor. <laughs> honestly, I don't know. I think New York tough is uh, there's a soft under, underneath that. All right.
I'll take your word for it. We'll catch up with Peter Cheer on what's happening down in Washington, D.C. and get his view on what it means for New York and the markets on Wall Street. We'll do that in about 30 minutes. Before we get there, we need to catch up with Bill Dudley, too, the former New York Fed president. Looking forward to that. Equity futures up 21 on the S&P, 42.52, up a half of 1%. Yields unchanged, 148.68. What's an insult of New York, Lisa? I'm with New York. Yeah, oh, Been, yeah. You know, I'm very yeah. much New York. Yeah, you love how clean the streets are. I love, you know I love New York. I know Don't even you. try and frame things that way. 4252. <laughs> this is my home. This is Bloomberg. Welcome home. From New York City, live on TV and radio for our audience worldwide, here's the price action this Thursday morning. About an hour away from jobless claims in America. Equity futures drifting higher, 42.51, up 20. We advance a half of 1%. A nice move on the S&P. The Nasdaq, too, we advance there, almost six-tenths of 1%. Keep in mind, just away from an all-time high, a couple of inches away, 42.57 is the intraday all-time high, the S&P 500. One to watch once we get the cash open a little bit later. In the bond market, twos, tens and thirties. In your bond market, we look a little something like this. A summer Thursday feel to a bond market with yields pretty much unchanged through the curve. Your 10-year, 148.85. Unchanged there on 30s too at 2.1090%. Let's get to something that has changed in the last 30 minutes. It's the shape of sterling, cable, the pound against the US dollar, a gap lower. The pound right now, 139.18. If you were positioning for a hawkish surprise, maybe you got a surprise for everyone else. It's more of the same. That transitory theme coming from the Bank of England, and it's bye-bye to the Bank of England chief economist, Andy Haldane. He dissents. He wants a reduction in the overall size of the asset purchase programme. The rest of the Bank of England say farewell, good riddance, maybe. Not my view, just perhaps. Some people thinking it, at least. The pound right now, 139. 14. Taylor Riggs with some stocks this morning. Hey, Taylor. You know, John, we got some interesting comments yesterday from Barry Stern, look, talking about the peak hype cycle. And of course, some of that comes, as he mentions, Clover Health and some of the other SPACs in just terms of the money sloshing around in the system. So I'm taking a look at Clover Health. I'm also taking a look at some other of the meme stocks, Sundial and Torchlight Energy, which we cannot stop talking about, given the wild swings that we continue to see. And of course, stories out this morning that fundamental managers who sold GameStop well, Maybe some of them are regretting it, given the massive run-up that we continue to see. And so those are shares that we continue to follow. Let's take a look, though, at some of the other fundamental stories. We have to talk about the reopening in MGM, where we are on that upgrade to a buy at Deutsche Bank with a $54 price target. Tesla is also a fundamental story here. You're getting a lot of competition from Porsche, Audi, Mercedes coming, making an aggressive push in that EV space. Regions Financials, of course, with the Fed stress test for the big banks. What does it mean for some of the regional players, given the massive underperformance that we've seen in June? That reverses this morning as we're up six-tenths of 1%. And can we talk about Beyond John, I have very interesting comments on this. Duncan said that they still are selling some of the breakfast sausages. Okay. JP Morgan saying that their checks showed that there weren't the Beyond Meat breakfast sausages. I'm a Beyond Meat fan, I think, but I'm not sure how I feel about the breakfast sausage. So just walk me through this. Are we struggling <laughs> to track whether they're still selling the Beyond Correct. Meat breakfast sausage. Yes, and there's also okay. like a Taco Bell plant-based thing going on. It's a very, very delicate debate. Lovely. Do you eat Taco Bell? I, I do. You do? Okay. <laughs> yes. Good to know. So does John. Meat, down by 1.3%. Do I? Yeah, I often see you there. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yes, I do. <laughs> are, we, are we paid by... No, we're not. No, I don't. <laughs> Joining us now, Carry Bill on. Dudley. I'm pleased to say the Bloomberg Opinion columnist, Princeton University senior research scholar and former New York Fed president joins us too. Bill, it's good to catch up with you. And I enjoy your pieces and your piece out this morning. It's a little bit technical, but I want you to run through things. When the Bank of England comes out with a rate decision, bank rate means a lot for a lot of people in the UK, for business loans, for mortgages. The Fed funds rate is a different beast and you're pushing back against the continued use of targeting the Fed funds rate and using it almost, Bill. Can you just walk me through the thinking here? Well, the federal funds rate used to be important because reserves in the banking system were quite scarce and so banks had to trade the federal funds rate federal funds between themselves to satisfy the reserve requirements. That's not the situation today. The banking system's awash in reserves as the Federal Reserve continues to buy 120 billion of treasuries and agency mortgage-backed securities. So the federal funds market has become very different, very much, much smaller and much more idiosyncratic than it has been in the past. The motivation for this piece was the fact that the Fed last week 
uh, had to make a technical adjustment to two short-term interest rates, the rate they pay on overnight reverse repurchase agreements and the interest rate they pay on reserves, five basis points each. Why supposedly keep the federal funds rate closer to the middle of its target range? Why are we targeting the federal funds rate in the first place at this point? It's no longer an important market. The Fed has the ability just to pay the interest on reserves. Why not, why not ditch the federal funds rate target and just set the interest rate on reserves at the level that's appropriate with the monetary conditions that the Fed seeks to accomplish? Well, that's your simple solution. In your words, three words, drop the target. Bill, could you anticipate a communication issue around doing that if they were to do that this year? I think they could explain it very easily. They, they would no longer have to make these technical adjustments that I think are more confusing than illuminating. Also, another thing that they need to do is, is exempt reserves from the leverage ratio. As they add more reserves to the banking system, that's putting downward pressure on rates. The whole reason why they had to make this technical adjustment to the federal fund, to these two interest rates, push the federal fund rate up, was the fact that they're flooding the banking system with reserves. And banks don't want the reserves because of the leverage ratio, which is starting to bind as a capital requirement for banks. And Bill, so if you exempt reserves from the leverage ratio, then that problem goes away as well. And Bill, you're talking about the glut of uh, deposits that you're seeing on some of the bank books, with some banks even saying to their corporate clients, we don't even want your money uh, because it is getting to be excessive. Just taking a step back, how much is the change that you're proposing evidence that we're going to remain in this environment with a system awash in cash and the Federal Reserve pumping uh, money continually into it, even though there is so much cash? How much is it just sort of an acknowledgement of that reality over the near and frankly, not even that near term? Well, I think that we're going to be in a system where there's lots of reserves in the banking system for some time to come. First of all, the Fed's not going to stop their asset purchases quickly. It's probably going to continue to well into the fall. So the balance sheet is going to continue to grow. The amount of reserves in the banking system are going to continue to grow. And then when it finally decides to start to normalize its balance sheet, the balance sheet is so big now, it's going to take a long time to get it back to, you know, the one and a half trillion of excess reserves that we had prior to the pandemic. So I think we have a system where the interest rate the Fed pays on reserves is the primary tool of monetary policy. Let's acknowledge that. I understand, Bill, the argument that the Fed wants to continue with their very easy money policies just simply to allow inflation to pick up and allow employment to uh, get to a better place. However, people have pointed to certain frothier areas in the mortgage market in particular. Do you think it's advisable? Do you think that it would harm uh, the progress that the Fed is allowing to happen in the economy for them to pare back on some of the mortgage debt purchases that they make every month? I think it would have an effect more on expectations about future monetary policy. We tell the market the Fed ha has now acknowledged that they've made substantial further progress towards their goals. And so people would uh, change their expectations of the timing of tightening. So I don't think it would be that important in the narrowness of the housing market. I think it would be quite important as a signal of the of monetary policy and the timing of, of tightening of monetary policy. Is that the preferred method versus... Well, Versus... So I don't think they're going to do it. I don't think they're going to do it. I think they're going to be pretty patient here. What about perhaps maybe more of an equal waiting taper? I think a la December 2013 and a discussion of $5 billion in treasuries, $5 billion in MBS. Is that just more of an easy path to go? Well, I think that uh, you have a template from the last cycle. And so to deviate from that template, you have to have a really good reason. Mm. I don't think they have a really good reason. I think if they deviate from what they did last time, just raises a bunch of questions. What are you concerned about? Why aren't you following the game plan that you followed last time? What did we learn from last time around, Bill? The lessons of the last time we reduced asset purchases and eventually actually had some balance sheet reduction several years later. Well, I think it went, in, in, in all fairness, quite smoothly once the Fed communicated clearly about what the, what the, what the sequence was going to be. First, we stop the asset purchases, we can we taper the asset purchases down, then we raise short-term rates, and then we finally start to normalize the size of the balance sheet. So this time, the market has a template to look at. Last time, they didn't. And so there was a lot more uncertainty about what the Fed was going to do uh, in the last cycle compared to this cycle. I think it's one reason why the markets are pretty comfortable with what the Fed's up to. Do you think that there's too much Fed speak at this point? We've been talking about how there's very little dissent, and there basically is a Fed official every hour who's speaking. Well, there's always probably too much Fed speak. I mean, the <laughs> thing, thing to pay attention to is really the chairman, the vice chairman of the of the Board of Governors and the vice chairman of the Federal Open Market Committee. So Powell, Clarida, and Williams. Uh, Bill, what they say for jumping really, in. Are you saying ignore the Fed presidents when they go around doing speeches? Yes. 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't say ignore the Fed presence, but put a lot less weight on them because they're just one member of the committee. I mean, the, the, the big three set the agenda for the Federal Remark Committee. The committee's not going to do something if those three people aren't on board. So I, I, it's, it's, it's about weight. Don't ignore the presidents, but uh, don't uh, put too much weight on what, what one individual president might say. But just how much they influence the conversation inside the Federal Reserve when you have those FOMC meetings, when you had the likes of Plosser, Fisher really pushing back at the turn of the last crisis going through the recovery, just how much do they influence the conversation? I think they have any, they influence the conversation because they offer a, a different perspective. And I think diversity of views is actually important. Diversity of backgrounds is actually important in terms of getting good monetary policy making. But at the end of the day, uh, the committee is going to go where the consensus is. So if someone's always dissenting, they sort of marginalize themselves because they're not relevant in terms of figuring out where the where is the committee going to go uh, in the future. Right now, there's a lot of disagreement about, you know, when should we start to uh, paper asset purchases because people are uncertain about the, uh, the, the, the state of the recovery and how fast will it cut into uh, unused labor resources. So there's quite a bit of disagreement right now about timing. But the people that matter are Williams, Florida, and, of course, Powell, because uh, they're the ones who are going to determine the ultimate timing. Hey, Bill, it's good to catch up, as always. Good to see you. Great piece, too. Available on Bloomberg.com and on the Bloomberg Terminal. Bill Dudley there, Bloomberg opinion columnist and former New York Fed president. Just a little bit of insight there, Lisa, into the inner workings of the Federal Reserve. And this is the reason why markets are shrugging off some of the more hawkish dots uh, from last week's Fed meeting. Basically, people are saying that wasn't Fed Chair J uh, Jay Powell. It was not John Williams from the New York Fed. It wasn't Rich Clarida. So we don't have to pay attention to those dots. My question is, what is the purpose of all these Fed presidents, the regional Fed presidents? It's coming out and having a more hawkish tilt, warning about froth, warning about potential uh, upside surprises to inflation, if everyone just ignores them anyway, if basically it is going to be a Fed chair, <laughs> Powell, and nobody else. I think some healthy dissent is important. Are we getting that now from this Federal Reserve? I remember one interview with Jim Bullard, I think it was out on CNBC in the last couple of months, where he almost said that he was waiting for Chairman Powell to start the conversation about tapering. They are waiting for the chairman to almost cue what they can and can't talk about. Do you think that that's what it is, internal pressure, or do you think that they don't want to rattle markets too much and then push uh, the goals further out? I mean, the idea here Perhaps. that markets get very concerned by any hawkish tilt, even if it's a dot, the fact that there was that sort of flattening in the yield curve does get people's attention. But still, is this what counts as dissent? I don't know. Look, I will say in a world where you've just spent the last couple of years talking about this brand new framework, your high hands are tied to, to some degree. So maybe that's why this def defense of this more hawkish stance is just a little bit more muted than it otherwise be. Though I have to say, Lisa, it's got louder in the last couple of weeks. It's Bostic, Bullard, Kaplan just again and again and yeah. again. 42.51 on the S&P, advancing a half of 1%. Lisa Brambage, Taylor Riggs, Jonathan Farrow, Tom Keane back on Monday. Equities pushing all-time highs, up a half of 1% on the S&P. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. President Biden is traveling to North Carolina today to encourage more Americans to get the COVID-19 vaccine. His trip to rally comes 10 days before July 4th. The president's stated target date to see at least 70% of adult Americans at least partially vaccinated. The CDC says that so far, slightly more than 65% of U.S. adults have had at least one dose. The Chinese Defense Ministry says that exercises by the People's Liberation Army aircraft on, in the Taiwan Strait are a necessary response to a regional security situation. There was no elaboration. During a briefing in Beijing, a defense ministry spokesman urged the U.S. and other countries to abandon what he called a Cold War mentality and to stop talking about a Chinese military threat. Authorities in Sydney are rejecting calls from some health experts for Australia's most popular city to enter lockdown to control an outbreak of the Delta strain, the strain first identified in India. That's despite case numbers almost doubling to 31 in, over the past two days alone. The world's biggest maker of Bitcoin mining rigs is suspending sales of machines for spot delivery, hoping to prop up the prices. Bitmain Technology says it stopped selling new equipment after prices for top-tier rigs plunged by about... 75% since April, China's crackdown on crypto mining is causing miners to abandon their operations and dump machines on the market. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta, this is Bloomberg.
The conversation about crypto is a minor percent of any dialogue we have with any company worldwide. It's, mm. it's just not terribly important. Could crypto become a really important asset plat- class one day? Sure. If there was a digital dollar, a true digital yuan, that will change how every, you know, that would be much more impactful than any, uh, any other, like a crypto. Think there. Larry Fink, the BlackRock chairman and CEO from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside Lisa Bravitz and Taylor Riggs, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Tom Keane out of the building. Here's the price action. Equity futures, 42.51, up 20 on the S&P. We advance a half of 1%. Euro dollar, 119.40. We advance about a tenth of 1% there. Slightly stronger euro. Business confidence out of Europe this morning. French business confidence, German business confidence, it gets better. Outside of that in the bond market, yields unchanged, 148.85 on a 10-year, unchanged. If I was to tell you 12 months ago, this is where we'd be with international travel, I think you might have questioned that. Lisa, if I was to tell you 12 months ago, this would where we'd be with UK travel, even with these kind of numbers out of the UK. The Prime Minister speaking this morning, more than 60% of adults receiving two COVID-19 vaccinations, 83% receiving at least one. And he talks about the opportunity. That's the operative word here, opportunity, the opportunity we all have now to open up travel through the double jab. I just can't believe we're not there yet. I would agree, and I think that it's interesting to see places like Israel, which has one of the highest, most vaccinated populations out there, just closing uh, their borders to foreign travelers for even longer because of an increase in the Delta variant, even though the hospitalizations haven't picked up all that much. It just talks to this threshold, this fear that people have of COVID uh, that perhaps goes beyond what we're seeing in the hospital system. The airline business right now is just really tough for international travel. We've talked about about that a million times over the last couple of months. For domestic travel, that was meant to be the support, Taylor, the support for the likes of American Airlines. American Airlines have been aggressive about putting capacity back on, and we've seen it continuously over the last couple of weeks. American Airlines have had to cancel flights (laughs) because they can't get the staff, Taylor. You know, John, we spoke with the Southwest CEO on the close yesterday, and I brought up American Delta trying to scramble to hire a 1,000 pilots. He literally says that they can't bring workers back fast enough. Some of this, of course, is not just the airline industry. This is a broad U.S. global issue of a labor shortage, trying to bring labor workers back into the workforce. But it really speaks to the travel industry specifically, John, about how quickly demand came back. Perhaps maybe we were caught off guard just a little bit, though everything I'd read said this was going to be the roaring 20s. Brace yourself. Yeah, Taylor, you make the good point, though. This is just one case study, one example of a much bigger, broader story, particularly for the U.S. economy. And Lisa, we've asked continuously, when do we start to address these issues? Well, the answer to that is right now. My question is, when do we resolve them? When do we start to see real signs that they're being resolved? Is that the end of August, deeper through summer, beginning of September, maybe later? You've talked about humility, and we heard the same kind of tone out of Fed Chair Jay Powell, the uncertainty, as Tom says, make it up. They are making it up because we don't even understand why there is this friction in the labor market. I mean, do you buy this idea that it is childcare? Do you buy the idea that it is a skills mismatch? Or do you buy the idea that it's because people are getting enhanced unemployment benefits and want to just stay home? I think that the yeah, evidence is really unclear exactly what the main driver it is. Probably a little bit of all. Oh, September's the date in the diary then, right? When the kids go back to school? It's my date in the, the diary. The additional UI expires. That's when we're going to find out. You For, know, John, Yeah. all I know is my cauliflower rice at Chipotle is up 5% because they have to pass on the costs from higher wages. But is that a one-off shift in the price level or the beginning of something more persistent? If it's transitory, they wouldn't be passing on permanent price well, increases. No, that's not the, the definition of transitory. That's a one off change in the price level. Well, Persistent would be if that was to happen again and again and again. It's a Is rate this of just change. a one off change in a price level or the beginning of something more persistent? It's a rate of change question. And actually, speaking exactly to that rate of change question, there was a story on the Bloomberg today about used car prices and how actually they are poised to decelerate. Yes, they're going to still be increasing, but not at the same pace as some of the supply chain kinks get worked out. Uh, so, I mean, to that point, John, that would seem to confirm the transitory idea. 42.52 on the S&P 500 this morning, getting close to all time highs. It's the same debate. It's value versus growth, growth versus value, banks versus tech. Take your pick, any flavor. Let's bring in Dave Wilson, a Bloomberg Stocks editor for more with his chart of the day. Morning, Dave. Run us through it. 
Well, what we're talking about here, John, is correlation between the S&P 500 pure growth and pure value indexes. So you're talking about a subset of the broader S&P 500, you know, specifically companies that best fit into these growth and value categories. Now, you know, we've certainly seen some back and forth over the past year or so. You know, value stocks kind of taking the lead for a while as, you know, we, we got uh, back from the lows of March of last year and more recently in the past month or so he has been a bit of a shift toward growth and what you get out of that is that you know the correlation just isn't there the way it has been historically in fact you're looking at the lowest level since October 2000 in terms of the relationship between these pure growth and pure value indexes so it really does matter more than it has for more than 20 years which way you go when it comes to the growth versus value argument. And that really plays out, you know, when you look at, say, the past three years, uh, you, you've got to try to basically pure growth and pure value track each other until the lows of last year, and then things kind of start going their own way. All right, so what is the why behind this? Is this an idea that a lot of uh, fund managers come on and say, which is it's time to be a stock picker? Is this the idea that, uh, that the, the rotation under the hood of the equity indexes has been abnormally uh, significant? Well, perhaps more the rotation, you know, because – you have to go back uh, more than a decade to really see the last time that value stocks kind of led the way. And, you know, arguably more recently, that's uh, been flipped on its head a bit. You know, we've seen a return to, to growth. I mean, still value one of the best performers on the year. If you look at, you know, various factors that people pay attention to when it comes to investing, you know, that said, I mean, with the turnaround we've seen more lately, again, you, you kind of get value and growth each going their own way as opposed to moving together, which has been the tendency over time. Dave, good to catch up. Really interesting stuff, and that debate continues. I'll catch up with Jonathan Gulliver, Credit Suisse, and Savita Subramaniam of Bank of America a little bit later about clinging onto that idea that the cyclicals can outperform from here. And also, we need to talk about the fiscal plan down in D.C., or the lack thereof, Lisa. Peter Cheer, running much of what is driving the market could be linked to doubt about the size and effectiveness a fiscal stimulus. Pete's going to join us in about five minutes, Lisa. Yeah, but you know what's weird? Whenever I ask people about this, they all say it's not priced in any kind of fiscal stimulus. So if this is the disappointment, then it has been priced in. And if it's not priced in, then are we taking also tax hikes off the table, which also could be a potential downside risk to stocks? Oh, so it's bullish or bearish? Which one is it? I'm going to stay with bearish on both sides. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. I'm going to be consistent, true to form. I you am know? not shocked. Nobody <laughs> is. <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, you've got the fiscal stimulus on one side. People say that, that you know people haven't priced in the boost. And on the flip side, people say that they've priced in the potential negative drag from higher taxes. So actually, yeah. could it be a bullish surprise? Okay. Look at that. Thank you. <laughs> I think. The wonderful Lisa Bramitz, <laughs> Taylor Riggs, and Jonathan Farrow. TK's back with us on Monday, taking a long, well earned, long weekend. 42.51 on the S&P 500, advancing about 20. We're up a half of 1% this Thursday morning. 35 minutes away from jobless claims in America. We'll run through the economic data for you a little bit later in the next hour. For our audience worldwide on radio and TV, this is Bloomberg. The bump in the road is that the roads are recovering inflation. Powell is very optimistic that we are going to get a robust labor market recovery, that inflation will be contained. I'm not surprised also to hear the language of Fed Chair Jay Powell. They're committed to going at this gradually. What they don't want to do is take a dramatic and drastic action to really result in a sharp shift. He's just been saying essentially, wait, look, uh, and we'll respond if we need to. But there ain't no inflation problem. This this is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. From New York City, for our audience worldwide, good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Bravitz and Taylor Riggs, I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK taking a long weekend. He'll be back with us on a Monday. Looking at the price action right now, 42.52, advancing 21 points on the S&P 500. Lisa, your takeout last week, it's as you were. I mean, honestly, it's amazing to me that we're finding that the melt up into uh, new highs is just basically treated with a shrug. But it's just same old, same old at this point, given the fact that people have faith that the Fed is going to keep on hold for the foreseeable future. And we are desensitized from all time highs, seemingly, Taylor, once again this morning. 
unbelievable the resiliency of these markets, the inflush of cash every time there's a pullback, the calm with the 15 print on the VIX, and John, the calm within the bond markets, despite all the ups and downs that we've had in the last week, a very, very well-behaved bond market below a 150 on the 10-year. We've settled down in and around 150 just south of that on the 10-year, Taylor. Let's get to the price action right now. 42.53 in sight on the S&P 500, 42.57, your intraday all-time high on the S&P. We advance a half of 1% this Thursday morning, about 29 minutes away from jobless claims in America. Yields unchanged, as Taylor points out, 148.51 on a 10-year yield. In the FX market, sterling with a gap lower off the back of a Bank of England decision, unchanged. No hawkish surprise there, sterling weaker, euro firmer, euro dollar 119.33, stronger by almost a tenth of 1%. The price action elsewhere, though, Lisa, it's been pretty muted, to yeah. be fair, the last couple of days. It's been pretty muted. I will say the most interesting uh, moves have been in lumber, where you've seen the price come down significantly in copper, where you also have seen the price come down, some of the deceleration in the price increases that have led to a lot of the inflation. And I wonder how much that's coloring the view that's being expressed by the bond market. And deceleration in growth on the horizon too. Lisa, we've been talking about that for a while on this show. At some point in 21, you start to think about 22 and 23. Pretty quickly, I think we're already doing that. And I think that the idea that the people are not worried about the Fed taking a hawkish tilt really puts in the forefront a deceleration in growth, peak growth kinds of fears as being the main potential risk to markets right now, to equities at all time highs. And the uncertainty around the fiscal outlook, not just the monetary policy outlook as well. Peter Chair of Academy Securities running about that recently. I want to bring in Pete now for more. Peter Chair of Academy, the head of macro strategy. Pete, let's just start there. The uncertainty around the fiscal program, the fiscal effort down in Washington, how important is that for what we're seeing play out in this market? I think it's actually incredibly important. When you look at bond yields, right, people have been talking about the impact the Fed has had. But when you started seeing doubt about how big the fiscal stimulus is going to be, that's when you started seeing bond yields come down. So that to me is a concern. I guess there's some hopeful news overnight, but the packages seem smaller and taking longer to implement than I would have liked to see. Though I'm still quite positive on growth, but really the fiscal story is probably as important as what's going on with the Fed and just not getting enough attention. And Pete, do you think that's what's holding back this bond market, keeping a lid on things at 148.51 on 10s? Yeah, if you go back three, four months ago, I think people were expecting two trillion, three trillion potentially of long dated bonds being issued to support a big fiscal stimulus. That's kind of off the table right now, right? We're already down to talking about a trillion dollars. The bond market can digest that. So I think it's less supply is helping the bond market and a little bit of concern that the growth isn't going to be quite as good as they wanted. I think it's going to turn out to be good, but that's being priced in as that doubt right now. So, Peter, when I speak to fund managers and they say that a fiscal stimulus hasn't been priced in yet and that anything would be an upside surprise. Is that hogwash? I think it's not being priced into the economy. I think it's being priced into the markets, if that makes any sense. So I think we haven't seen the job creation yet. One concern and one thing we're looking at, right, is we have this jobs, you know, quote unquote, problem right now where we already have a lot of unfilled jobs. So some of this infrastructure spending, which would have been very good at creating jobs, how good is that if we can't fill those jobs? So I'm hoping as we end the summer, as some of these, you know, stimulus checks, and, and also, more importantly, as schools fully reopen so people can get back to the workforce, we'll see that you know, gap between the number of jobs available and the number of people wanting to work close, because that's going to be critical for growth next year. Amen to the uh, school's point. There is a question about whether what you're saying is an argument for big tech, because not only do you not necessarily get the increase in interest rates, so this actually does uh, bleed into the argument to buy them as a steady cash flow, but it also takes off the table, perhaps, some of the tax rate hikes that people were talking about that would disproportionately affect big tech? I think the concern I still have is that on big tech, this minimum tax, I think, is the way this administration is trying to go. They're really not going to focus as much on the statutory rate and the effective rate. So I think that could impact big tech. And I think we are going to ultimately start seeing higher yields because I don't think the inflation has gone away story is at all correct. And I know today people are talking about lumber and all these other things. I think the biggest inflation news is us you know, as a country going after the China solar pro providers, right? I think we are going to see more and more scrutiny into supply chains, what our suppliers look like. And we're going to find that either they're not up to our standards in terms of how they treat the employees, how they treat you know, sustainability. And that is going to be inflationary, whether they increase their costs or we have to find new suppliers. So I think that's the story that's going to drive inflation. And looking at, you know, commodity prices is one thing, but that's going to be the long-term inflationary, you know, driver is this push towards ESG and real scrutiny of supply chains.
So settle the debate for us. John and I were chatting earlier. My cauliflower rice at Chipotle has gone up 5%. They're raising prices, passing those on to the consumers. Are these one-off events, or is this going to be a series of further price increases, that rate of change that we continue to talk about? I think it's going to be uh, you know, ongoing. I think when people talk about peak growth, okay, sure, we might hit peak growth, but we might get 6% next year, 5% the year after. That's going to be plenty inflationary. And if this is really tied to job creation and bringing back jobs, the, um, you know, this pressure to make everything sustainable, I think you're going to see price pressures along the board. And right now, again, when I look at sustainability, that is one of the reasons I think we're going to see price pressures is the belief that customers can pay those prices and will pay those prices, right? You like the cauliflower rice, it's very popular. People are going to pay those. So I I think that's not a one-time trend. I think this is ongoing. Are we then peak margins? That might be closer to, but again, and so I think we're peak margins in some ways, but what I'm seeing when we talk to large corporations is you might be able to give up some profitability, and if you're deemed as more sustainable, right, if you fit that ESG mm-hmm. mandate, your P.E. ratio can still go higher because there is such demand for that. So I think the focus is on your final stock price. Maybe you can actually have a higher stock price with smaller margins especially if you're pushing into that whole sustainability ESG area that's attracting both consumers and investors. I don't have a view on this. I want to be very clear about what I'm trying to explain. And Pete, please weigh in. There is a difference between a one-off change being permanent. You can still say that things are transient because what you're talking about is the rate of change being transitory, that these levels will not persist over time. And I think those two concepts, Pete, get confused. Yes. And, you know, if we go back to the cauliflower rice, we might not see another hike in that for two years, but it doesn't mean that something else isn't going to get hiked next month or the month after. So I think there's just the sustained pressure and you are starting to see wage inflation, right? You're seeing people demand higher wages and that's going to continue. And even when you look at lumber, it's probably still up 20 percent. So that's a massive, massive gain, right? If you think about 3 percent inflation as the target, you've just covered still probably five years worth of inflation. So uh, let's not get overly, you know, worked up about the current uh, moves. I just think this is going to be very, very persistent. You're going to see prices continue to move up. And it's going to be on the things that we consume. I think that's one of the other big issues that we all face is how do we actually measure inflation and you know, what values are worthwhile and what's affecting our day-to-day life. And I would say right now, inflation is off the charts in what most of us actually buy. Let's talk about what it means for credit, Pete, your world. This was from Manny Roman of PIMCO speaking to us in the last 24 hours. In March 2020, you had real opportunity in high yield and private credit. It's been very good. There were special situations. A lot of it has played out. This early in the recovery, a lot of the spread tightening has played out. Just how different is this moment, Pete, compared to recoveries that gone by? Listen, I I think credit is actually fine right here. So, you know, we have CDXIG, investment grade uh, CDS index, trading at 50 basis points. That traded as low as 29 pre-financial crisis. I see no reason that doesn't get back to the mid-30s. It's kind of boring because you'd like to see the volatility. You'd like to see high yield get volatile. But even last week, I thought it was really important that credit spreads as a whole did fine. You had equity volatility all over the place. You had crypto moving all over the place. You even had these massive bond, bond moves. But Credit as a whole did very fine, and I think it's a little bit depressing when you talk to the active managers. Is everyone like things to go wide? You know, you'd like to get the big shorts on, but the reality is, I think it's a very boring market. Companies are very, very comfortably priced on credit. There's so much of an equity buffer for these companies. There's so much money coming into the markets. You're seeing corporations defeasing their pension plans by selling equities to buy bonds. So I think, as you know, almost as dumb as it sounds to say, at 50 basis points, you're supposed to be long credit. Take the summer off and watch it tighten. Um, It doesn't sound sexy. It doesn't sound fun. But I think, sadly, that's the right trade right now. Credit is very, very stable and should continue to grind tighter. Hey, boring is good compared to what people expected to happen. Pete, it's good to catch up. It's good to see you in the studio, too. Peter Cheer there, Academy Securities Head of Macro Strategy. Boring is not what people were looking for nine months ago, Lisa. No, and that is what they have gotten. I will just say to edify Pete's point, there was a deal that caught my attention overnight. It was a gun accessories maker called Magpul Industries, and they were trying to sell $250 million uh, of debt in order to pay a dividend to their private equity sponsors. They pulled the deal. And yes, this might be because of ESG considerations, but it also is because people are pushing back. This is discretion in markets, even at these really tight spreads. Where are spreads right now? Uh, They're at 280, uh, 280, yes. Tightest since 07. Correct. Isn't it crazy? It is insane. At this start of the recovery, this this close to the beginning of the recovery, and we're already there. 
So Howard Marks of Oak Tree has sounded the alarm before on high yield valuations and recently he came on Bloomberg television and he said, unfortunately, this makes sense, you know, and unfortunately not for the economy, because for the economy, if you can if you can borrow money for cheaply, that's good. But unfortunately, for investors who are not going to be getting that much and who probably can't afford to sell. The man himself, Howard Marks, when did you catch up with him last week? Yeah, last week. I should go back and watch that interview. Well, it was interesting to hear how he, who wants to stress opportunities, who wants to talk down valuation, says, look, we can't find a reason for this to sell off, especially with the Fed continuing the easy money policies. And frankly, with the cash flow just rushing in. Yeah, unreal. Lisa Bravitz, Taylor Riggs, Jonathan Farrow, Tom King back with us on Monday. Equities closing in on record highs, up 21 on the S&P, up a half of 1%. And just a shrug from so many people as this takes place, 42.52 on the S&P 500 from New York City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. With the first word news, I'm Rishka Gupta. Prime Minister Boris Johnson's government is to convene a London summit to help tackle the lagging COVID-19 vaccination rate in the UK's capital. The latest numbers show that 60% of Londoners have had at least one dose of the vaccine, compared with 73 to 79% across England's other regions. There's been a surge in Delta variant cases in the UK, though daily fatalities remain low. Queen Elizabeth II's income was hit hard by the pandemic as lockdowns and travel restrictions led to a 53% drop in income from tourists visiting royal palaces. Annual accounts show that without places like Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle open to visitors, the sovereign's income was cut to $13.1 million in the time period measured. That's down from a little more than $28 million a year earlier. And China has filed a lawsuit against Australia at the World Trade Organization over anti-dumping measures on some Chinese goods. The measure in question target Chinese products including wind towers and stainless steel sinks. Earlier this week, Australia said it would appeal duties imposed by China on its wine exports. And Bloomberg has learned that Hong Kong's Lala Move has filed confidentially for a U.S. IPO with top logistics and delivery firm is looking to raise at least $1 billion in the share sale. Lala Move provides on-demand van hailing and courier services across Asia, Latin America and the U.S. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. The U.S. economy is uh, really uh, on fire. Uh, almost everything is growing much faster. We've had uh, almost a perfect storm here uh, of, of massive government uh, uh, spending, uh, central bank uh, accommodation, uh, record low interest rates, uh, and that's a recipe uh, to, to really uh, power an economy. That was Stephen Schwartzman there, the Blackstone CEO from New York City this morning. Good morning. Alongside me, Lisa Bramberts, Taylor Riggs, Tom Keane will be back with us on Monday. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Here's the price action for you. Kicking things off this Thursday morning, approaching jobless claims in America, 12 minutes away. Equity futures up 21 to 42.52, advancing about a half of 1%. Euro dollar firmer by a little more than a tenth. Euro 119.39 against the US dollar. And yields unchanged, 148.35. Can we call it a snooze, Lisa Bramberts? It's maybe yeah. we can in the bond market. We can in the bond market. In stocks, it's snoozing up to record highs. But in bonds, it is stasis. That's get, all I can say. Get in a headline from Senator Portman. He says Manchin is supportive of the infrastructure package on offer. We're making a step forward here, Lisa, yeah, that's around been, infrastructure talks. That's been the uh, idea here, the golden ticket we were hearing about uh, earlier today, meeting with President Biden, the group of bipartisan senators. The question is, $559 billion, is that the end or is that the beginning of the fiscal spending we can expect over the next two years? Let's bring in Terry Haynes, shall we? Pangea Policy Foundry joins us right now. Terry, let's start there. What we can expect, as far as you're concerned, down in D.C. on the fiscal front? Uh, what we can what we can expect, firstly, is a touted 
uh, roughly $1 trillion infrastructure package, like the one I've been talking about for the last month or so, um, of which, as Lisa says, about $559 billion is new spending. It uh, brings up a, a dichotomy for markets, by the way. You'll hear Washington pump high numbers, but then a lot of it isn't new spending, and that's important to understand. Uh, the, co- the last COVID relief bill, for example, uh, touted as $2 trillion, but only $1 trillion is going to get spent this year. The rest uh, run out over the next eight years. So you're going to get that. Uh, are you going to get much of anything else uh, at this point? Uh, I really doubt it. Uh, the so-called uh, families plan, another uh, couple of trillion dollars, I think, is going to be very difficult to pass, even with all Democratic votes. And then what you're into is you're into spending, which is going to be largely flat uh, uh, into next year. And uh, and you've got uh, the debt ceiling as a uh, as a potential surprise. But Washington's attention is going to be taken up between now and the end of September, um, uh, a time in which uh, the House and the Senate are roughly in only one out of those next three months, uh, with getting the infrastructure bill done and uh, otherwise partisan warfare about all the other stuff I just mentioned. As we talk about $559 billion of new spending, Terry, how much political momentum is there behind balancing the budget, behind raising taxes or cutting spending ahead of that August uh, debt deficit ceiling? Oh, not none. Uh, you know, they, b- both parties talk about uh, debt and deficit when it's, uh, when politically when it suits them. Uh, Democrats did uh, over the four years of the previous administration. But uh, in, in reality, where the parties tend to come together, and as, as we've seen, uh, is on spending things. Uh, uh, COVID is a money spender. The China bill was a money spender. Uh, those things are money spenders, and uh, the parties come together around those things. But uh, most of the rest of it, you know, I think federal spending is going to be largely flat, as I say. Uh, but the rest of it, uh, you know, they will uh, they will fight over. But uh, but I don't think you're going to see anything beyond the infrastructure package today, anyway. Terry, where then is the momentum on how we're going to pay for all of this? Oh, um, we're going to pay for it, Taylor. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, I, you know, the the devil's in the details on the infrastructure bill. I, I edged up my odds to seventy five percent on infrastructure uh, last night, but on the news. But uh, I'll still give you twenty five percent. Things fall apart, and one of the details here is that uh, we don't exactly know uh, how they're going to try to pay for it, and they say they are going to pay for it, uh, and they say they're going to pay for it without tax increases. So uh, hmm. there are not insubstantial uh, difficulties here yet. And I, well, then I think what uh, markets see is a, a deal solidifying. I mean, the likeliest scenario here, the markets will see a deal solidifying over the next week, but they'll see wrangling around this deal and passing it out of both houses through the month of July. So there's going to be a lot of volatility here, and one of the details that will cause that volatility is exactly how the thing is paid for. And you don't worry about debt and deficits during wartime. When, then, should we begin to discuss it? Uh, you know, the you know, my view of this very simply is that uh, unless unless Washington gets a market signal that, uh, that, that th- there's too much debt or too much deficit, uh, Washington is not going to he- heed a call. You know, but my favorite example of this is the 2017 tax bill. And you know, no disrespect to anybody who put that together, but but you know, understand that the, the 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 red line for Republicans was they weren't going to to spend, they weren't going to go into deficit any more than 1.5 trillion over 10 years. Yeah. Now, when you're talking about you know how to manage a deficit increase, uh, that's a sign that you're really not serious about bringing the deficit down, and, and that's the way Washington is these days, regardless of party. Yeah, and Terry, if it weren't that way, people probably would be accusing it of not recognizing the reality we're in of pretty low bond yields. Since Tom Keene is not here, I'm going to channel him and talk about how close we are to the 2022 midterm elections. Is this a fiscal package that we're seeing coalesce in Washington, D.C., going to be viewed as a win for the Republicans or a win for the Democrats? Yes. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, Thank but, you. By, the infrastructure spending is bipartisan. Uh, but, Members of both parties want to see better roads, bridges, fundamental infrastructure. They all want to be able to go home and say that they did that. Uh, and uh, and the key, you know the key for me at the same time will be uh, seeing if they can goose them along more quickly. You know, there's uh, in my home state of Pennsylvania, there's been a 
ten, a, now a 10-year-long project is ju- just to redo 40 miles of old interstate. And if it's gonna, things are going to take that long, there's going to be a lot of frustration out there in the world. So one thing that they're going to need to do is goose their states along and make things uh, go a lot more quickly in order to gain the maximum amount of political benefit out of it. That's the best way of answering a Tom King question. Just... <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I'll take a note. Terry, thank you. Terry Haynes, Fangia Policy founder down in Washington, D.C. Just still, Lisa, an immense amount of uncertainty about the outlook here. I think there was a lot more conviction at the beginning of the year about what we would get from D.C. And now a lot of that's faded. Although if Terry Haynes is correct and the headline number is a trillion dollars, it's only $559 billion of new spending. But still, you could say that the headline number is a trillion dollars and it does not come with tax hikes. Then is it a wash? If no one's going to pay for it. I'm hearing you. Do you want me to answer? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, this is the issue, right? I mean, for market participants, how much does it matter if you don't have it offset? That's, to me, the issue. Yes, please answer. Well, right now, I think the market's speaking for itself, isn't it? Just nothing. Tumbleweed in Treasuries after a repricing over the last week back to 148. Taylor, as you pointed out, comfortably below 150, just in and around that level now. We've settled down. Unbelievable. A 15 handle on the VIX and is settling down within the bond markets, John, as you alluded to, despite some of the whipsaws we've seen on the long end of the curve. It was an average five year auction. I believe it was yesterday or two days ago. Very, very calm, even as we're thinking about how you get through a five year rate cycle hike with higher inflationary pressures. And there is still demand for some of that debt out there. Jobless claims moments away in the United States of America from New York City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg. New York City for our audience worldwide, live on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Taylor Riggs and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Tom Keane will be back with us on Monday, waiting for some economic data in America. As that starts to come out, let's just run through the price action briefly. 42.53 on the S&P 500, positive about a half of 1%. Jobless claims coming in a bit firmer than expected. It's the wrong kind of upside surprise. 411,000 against an estimate of 380. Just down from the previous month of 412, waiting to see if we get a revision there, Lisa, but coming in just a little bit hotter than expected. Yeah, and this to me is the conundrum. How much can we read into this data that has been incredibly messy? How much does this give us a true read on how many people are filing for jobless claims? Because if people really are looking at a tight labor market, why are we seeing 411,000 individuals filing anew? Durable goods coming in a little bit lighter too, a positive 2.3%. We were looking for something closer to 2.8%, coming off the back of a previous read of negative 1.3%. Are we done with the big surprises in either direction, do you think now? Lisa, as we work our way through the initial reopening. When you look at the surprise index from Citigroup, it does seem like that is the case. We're getting to a more normal state. Uh, the question is whether we've gotten to peak surprise upside, right? The idea being 10-year yields ticking lower on the heels of this. No drama, though. But still, this idea here of peak growth kind of getting uh, eked into this data. Did we get a move in a bond market of of like half a basis point? Half a basis point. It was Thank pretty you. dramatic. 148 on tens. Taylor, you're pouring through the data too. Your take. You know, you have a Federal Reserve that continues to focus on these labor markets. We heard from Jay Powell on Tuesdays. He continued to say this was interesting. He expected the jobs market to be better in the last few payrolls report. And unfortunately, when you sort of get unch like a jobless claims of 411 versus 412 last week, it sort of reiterates that unchanged nature with the Federal Reserve really focused on the labor data. Let's bring in Ira Jersey, shall we? Bloomberg Intelligence Chief U.S. Race Strategist. Ira, to begin with the economic data, your reaction? please. Yeah, it's uneven. And I think that that's been a, a trend that we've seen over the last couple of months. And the bond market obviously doesn't like it when you have a slowing in the second derivative. So basically, you know, things are still in an upward trajectory, but they're not as quick maybe as they were in uh, uh, in March and April of this year. And, and I'm looking at some of the durable goods numbers. And when you look at the revisions along with what we have, it's basically as expected. So, you know, even though the headline may have missed expectations, the fact is, is that we've had these upward revisions now that um, uh, for, for the uh, uh, for the April data. So it's making it seem like it's more more unchanged. As we get more and more of this, I think that that the bond market is going to continue to be range bound because 
people are going to wonder, hey, are we really in this upward trajectory for the long term or not? And that's going to be a big driving factor for Treasury yields. We just got some uh, more of the initial jobless claims data showing that the revised outlook from last week, the prior uh, initial jobless claim was actually revised upwards. Again, the wrong kind of surprise to 418,000 initial jobless claims. Ira, is there something deeper that we need to be taking from uh, these numbers, especially as a number of states start to roll back some of the enhanced unemployment benefits, that the labor market really is not coming back as quickly as people said, and it has to do with something more pervasive, uh, more persistent possibly, uh, than simply just either matching people with jobs or uh, reducing some of the employment benefits? Well, it's a, I think it's a little bit of, of, uh, of everything. So, you know, more people are obviously being laid off, and, and part of that may just be that there's um, th there's not work to be uh, to, to be done where uh, again this is a very uneven recovery right where um, you know we, we saw this big reopening and, and a lot of benefits from that reopening but now that's fading and keep in mind the initial jobless claims are only half of the equation right so that's only how many people are being let go not necessarily how many people are going to be rehired because there are certainly a significant number of industries where you are, will continue to see big rehiring you know particularly the hardest hit sectors so as, you know, hotels and, and different entertainment uh, and recreation functions, as those reopen, um, you, you will continue to see probably growth there. But again, it's that second derivative. So while, while we ha already had some really large increases in employment in some of those sectors, the pace of growth in, in that, uh, those, those sectors in terms of jobs is going to start to slow just a little bit. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of markets are going to kind of be range bound for a little while until we get some clarity on exactly how far this recovery can go. And, it, you know, quite frankly, the, the, for the market anyway, for the bond market, uh, the Federal Reserve turning more hawkish doesn't help the, the case for higher yields because not, not so much because they're, they're going to necessarily raise interest rates soon, but because as they, as they talk more hawkishly, people are going to worry that they're going to make a policy mistake because of all the fragility that still exists in the, uh, in the general economy. And there's still a lot of demand for risk-free assets, uh, even though know um, uh, that the Federal Reserve might be pulling back on its asset purchases later this year, or early next year. Ira, always good to hear from you, sir. Ira Jersey there, Bloomberg Intelligence Chief, U.S. Race Strategist. Joining us now is Stephen Stanley, Amherst Pierpont Securities Chief Economist. Stephen, are you getting a clearer picture of the economic data at the moment with the incoming data over the last couple of weeks? Well, I think the, the bottom line is, look, the economy, at least in the short term, is overheating. Um, you know, the, it started in housing, manufacturing now, um, certainly the labor market. I, I think basically demand has recovered faster than supply. Um, hopefully supply will catch up soon enough. But for the moment, um, you know, that seems to be the overarching story. You know, you've a uh, demand catching up with supply. Quit rates are at an all time high and there's a record number of job openings. Is there a labor shortage or is there a skills shortage? Right now, there's a labor shortage. I mean, you look at who it is that's complaining, you know, in terms of companies the most vehemently about not being able to hire people. And it's, it's for the most part, it's people, it's firms on the lower end of the skill set. Um, so I, I think it's really more a shortage of warm bodies at this point. And, you know, for all the reasons that Chairman Powell and others have, have laid out, chances are that things are going to kind of ease up over the next few months as we move into the summer and then uh, into the fall, I think things will start to normalize. Stephen, we've seen a number of states uh, throughout the United States reduce some of the enhanced unemployment benefits over the past few weeks. I'm wondering whether we have any preliminary data as to whether more people actually went out and got jobs, whether this actually eased some of the frictions we've been talking about. Yeah, I think it's a little early yet. Um, you know, I did see anecdotally that there was a little bit of an uptick in um, inquiries on some of the job search sites in the states that that announced um, that they were cutting the benefits early. Um, but look, the 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 federal benefits numbers lag by a few weeks, so we don't have any hard data yet uh, for the states that have ended the benefits. We're probably not going to see it in the payroll data to any meaningful extent until the July numbers, which come out in early August, because you know the June survey period came basically was the week before the first tranche of states cut the benefits. So I, I think it's a little early just yet. We may start to hear some anecdotes, but we're not going to get hard data on this for, for at least a few more weeks. Stephen, your view right now on how this is playing out at the FOMC, do you think a lot of this makes sense? 
Well, I, I think what we learned last week is that they've been surprised to the upside for both the economy and inflation. And they're kind of backpedaling a little bit from you know their game plan coming into the year, which was to be on hold for a very long time. Um, I, my guess is they're going to kind of be kept on that um, defensive stance. Uh, I think the inflation numbers are going to be high at least for another month or two. Uh, I do expect that the labor market data are probably going to start to get incrementally better uh, over the next few months. So I, I think they're going to continue to be surprised to the upside. And I think they're probably going to end up moving a little more quickly than they had originally envisioned. What does that look like, Stephen, then, relative to what they envisioned? Yeah, so so my assumption at this point is that the, the taper announcement comes at the September FOMC meeting. They start to actually taper in October, which probably puts me about three months ahead of the consensus. And then I think, you know, we get a rate hike around the middle of next year, which, again, you know, maybe puts me, um, you know, three to six months ahead of certainly where the Fed is and, and maybe a little ahead of the market consensus as well. So, Stephen, how are they going to communicate that, given the fact that Jay Powell has reiterated his dovish stance? And it seems like just some of the uh, regional Fed presidents like Jim Bullard uh, agree with you that a 2022 rate hike is in the cards. Yeah, well, right now, as as Powell and others have indicated, they're really not focused on rates just yet. The first thing they, the first order of business is, is uh, asset purchases. They have to begin to taper those. And I think most people on the committee would like to end asset purchases before they start to raise rates. So, um, you know, to the extent that they're feeling like maybe they need to raise rates a little earlier, that argues for an earlier and uh, uh, an earlier beginning to tapering and then a quicker process. And I think that's a that's going to be a key difference between this time around and 2014. I, I don't think they're going to have the luxury of moving very slowly on the taper process. I think they're going to have to get that done um, more quickly this time than they did last time around. And that's the worry a lot of people have, actually, Stephen. It's good to catch up and get your view on things. Stephen Stanley there, Amherst Pierpont, Securities Chief Economist. Just off the back of this data, dollar a little bit weaker, dollar index a little bit lighter. We shave about a tenth of 1% off the dollar index. Just to turn to the broader market, your bond market, basically unchanged, almost down about a half a basis point on a 10-year yield right now. Lisa, still south of 150. I'm struggling to understand, though, with some of these downside disappointments, uh, the idea of downside economic surprises that we've been seeing, how we could get to a place where we accelerate the tapering and we accelerate rate the rate hike what would be the trigger for that and that's what I'm thinking about right now would it be labor market progress would it be inflation that seems to be more persistent uh, based on what we're seeing right now with auto prices and the potential deceleration there and lumber prices not seeing where that comes into play either so yes this is a worry to echo what you were saying but I'm just not seeing it necessarily played out in the data just yet it's that commitment to being late from the Federal Reserve they've basically wrote into their framework that we're now going to be data dependent, not forecast to pay to depend and outcome dependent, which will leave them to be late by definition, Lisa. And if they're late, there's this concern that once they do start to move, they have to move more quickly. Well, but that is predicated, and I agree with you. That's predicated, though, on the idea that we will get inflation, that we'll pick up more materially. And I think that that really is the question. I mean, none of us know the answer to this, but if people are worried about that, why are we not seeing inflation expectations pick up materially? Yeah. Coming up on the program in the next hour at the Open, I'll be catching up with Savita Subramaniam of Bank of America. We'll be catching up with Jonathan Golub of Credit Suisse as well. Going into that, equities approaching all-time highs 4252 on the S&P 500. Taylor Riggs, a final word before I run on this equity market, climbing back towards record highs. Record highs and unch across the board, 25 basis points on the two year. We go nowhere, John. Pretty dull elsewhere, isn't it, Taylor? <laughs> Taylor Riggs, Lisa Brambis, Jonathan Farrow, more of us tomorrow. Tom Keane will be back with us on Monday after his long weekend. Do we get to call it a sabbatical when Tom takes time off. <laughs> I'm sure you will. So it's I, not about whether you I, get I, to I, or not. I will, I will call it that on Monday when he returns. Your equity market, 42.52. Heard worldwide on Bloomberg Radio, seen worldwide on Bloomberg TV. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. With the First One News, I'm Rishka Gupta. The sea view side of a beachfront condo tower collapsed in the Miami area town of Surfside early today. The collapse trapped residents in rubble and twisted metal and sent a cloud of debris throughout the neighborhood. Firefighters were seen pulling survivors from the concrete debris. In a tweet, Miami-Dade police said one person has died in the collapse. U.S. officials are confirming that details of the genetic makeup of some of the earliest samples of the coronavirus in China were removed 
from an American database where they were initially stored at a request of Chinese researchers. The U.S. National Institutes of Health says that the data first submitted to the U.S.-based sequence read archive in March 2020 were requested to be withdrawn by the same researcher three months later. And President Biden is traveling to North Carolina today to encourage more Americans to get the COVID-19 vaccine. His trip to Riley comes 10 days before July 4th, the president's stated target date to see at least 70% of adult Americans at least partially vaccinated. The CDC says that so far, slightly more than 65% of U.S. adults have had at least one dose. California Governor Gavin Newsom is set to face a recall vote after petitioners collected enough signatures to trigger an election. Newsom has faced scrutiny for his efforts to control the pandemic with strict lockdowns, which fueled the movement to remove him from office. He was criticized for dining without a mask at a restaurant last November while telling Californians to avoid social interactions. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta, this is Bloomberg. I am concerned about inflation overshooting by more and for longer. And I'm also worried that we'll see a second half of the year where the economy is running really hot, first and foremost, the U.S. economy. And that will have spillover and spillback effects into the global economy. That was Alex Weber, UBS chair, talking about the hopes, the fears of faster inflation for banks, certainly. Faster inflation would be a good thing if it steepened the yield curve and led them to more profitability. Since the end of May, uh, the S&P financial sector actually is down 4.7 percent on that flattening yield curve. Now we have the CCAR reviews, the stress tests by the Federal Reserve. We expect results today, 4.30 p.m. Jeff Hart, <coughs> excuse me, will be watching that. Piper Sandler, senior analyst for research. Jeff, thank you so much for being with us. What do you expect to get out of the stress tests today? Yeah, good morning. You know, I I'm actually expecting it to be uh, much less eventful than, uh, than in the past. This is kind of the first non-pandemic CCAR under the stress capital buffer methodology. So, I mean, we're unlikely to get specific dollar amounts kind of from the companies that we've gotten in the past. And so there'll be probably less information out there, which is going to make it uh, harder to to be able to actually call winners and losers, you know, tonight as opposed to over the course of the, of the next year. Jeff, what's your expectation in terms of how the market will respond, given the fact that the expectation is for all of the banks to pass with flying colors and to be able to uh, buy back more shares and pay out bigger dividends? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it still doesn't seem like anyone should fail in that, you know, all these banks passed last year and they've built a lot of capital kind of since then. So that, that shouldn't be too much of an issue. I mean, the thing that could get interesting is to the extent that someone's stress capital buffer, as the Fed calculates it, changes meaningfully from what it was last year. I mean, that, that, that could inject some, some excitement into it. But it, it seems like it's going to be, I, I think, a fairly straightforward um, exercise. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of see what, what kind of results we end up getting out. But I mean, the bottom line good news is the banks are going to be able to start returning capital again. That's been some pretty big buybacks. And I actually think all of them will, will you know, raise their dividend, which is, is kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of unique to this year as well. But the, um, it, it just kind of in the past, you've been able to call winners and losers. It's been kind of a night where who came out the best. Uh, I don't think we're actually going to get, you know, specific dollar amount capital plans from many of the, the banks. To the extent we get some, that will make it more interesting. But I think it'll be more a uh, we're going to raise our dividend X amount and here's our excess capital under the stress capital buffer. We'd like to return it to shareholders in a, you know, prudent manner or something like that as opposed to, you know, go back two years ago, a company would come out and say we're planning to buy back $5 billion, you know, worth of stock, and you could kind of judge that better. Jeff, from the market perspective, there's been some big underperformance for the financials as of late. Does anything today change the game in terms of how you're thinking about some of these dividends, some of these buybacks, a boost perhaps to the share price? You know, I, I don't think it's going to change it a whole lot. I mean, kind of as you, banks have had a pretty a pretty nice run, and, and I think 
when we started seeing kind of interest rates maybe going going another way, it, it became kind of an excuse for for some selling. But when I kind of look at kind of the outlook for banks over the next, let's call it a year or two, I think it's still constructive and still positive. And capital returns are a big part of that. I just think that's kind of expected that they're going to be pretty good. So I, I don't think we're necessarily going to get anything. Um, surprising tonight that's going to make people that much more excited or that much more scared of the bank specifically. Within your research, are you seeing a bifurcation between some of the big banks and maybe some of the more regional players, or is this broad-based a positive environment? I think it's pretty uh, broad-based positive environment. Um, I think the bigger players, when you start looking at the, the universal banks, like a J.P. Morgan or a Bank of America, are probably in a little bit, a bit of a better position in that capital markets have been really strong and they have big capital markets businesses. And until we actually get the kind of loan growth and, and you know, higher interest rates, not just at the 10-year um, you know, scale is increasingly important to banking, and these guys have it. So I think the environment we're in here now kind of plays into the big guys' hands and as we kind of migrate to some loan growth, which I do think we'll see. It's a matter of, of, of when, not if, and hopefully some, some higher interest rates, you know, that then it kind of becomes more probably good for banks in general. Jeff, I'm wondering, just zooming out, there is a question of how much financials really hinge on the yield curve. A flatter yield curve tends to be bad for banks, thus the underperformance that Taylor is talking about. Was the reaction from last week's Fed meeting concerning to you, the idea that if the Fed takes any steps whatsoever about backing away from some of their easy money policies, that the yield curve actually flattens, not steepens, that this will actually bode poorly for the financial sector? Um, not, not so much. I mean, it, it's interesting. Bank stocks tend to move with the 10-year, even though, you know, something like the maybe five-year, six-month spread means a lot more for their fundamentals. So the, the, the stocks tend to move. Uh, so as, as we kind of look at it here, the 10-year the coming down typically will, will, will bring the bank stocks down. But I don't really think the, the interest rate environment for them has changed a whole lot over the the last couple of weeks. We're still kind of waiting for the short end to go up, and that's what, what we really ultimately need to see. Ideally, the Fed starts raising short-term interest rates and the curve steepens because they're responding to a strong economy, and that'd be really good for banks. I suppose that the, the scarier situation would be if they're responding to inflation without that strong economic growth. But as long as the, the economic growth is driving it, that, that's, you know, that's, that should be that should be good news for banks. Jeff Hart, thank you so much for being with us. Jeff Hart, Piper Sandler, senior analyst for research. We're getting those stress test results again at 4.30 p.m., the first post-pandemic stress test results. Taylor, you talked about the underperformance of the financial sector, and I do find it fascinating that it really has come on the heels of a, a sort of a rejiggering in financial expectations, that perhaps there is this transitory growth in inflation and that the Fed is correct. I'm wondering going forward, what is being priced in to your question, is your sense that people are still going long financials or that they're backing away at this point because it's all the, all the good news that's already been priced in? I've heard increasingly notes like UBS yesterday saying that they reiterate this pro-cyclical stance, Lisa, that indeed the market took a little bit of a pullback, but it is this reflationary, inflationary trade, despite perhaps uh, what the bond markets are telling us within the calm on a 210 on, on a 30 year. But it really has been a little bit of both, maybe a little bit of tech, maybe a little bit of cyclical, but it certainly has not been get out of the cyclical trade. It's done. Yeah, no, not I would agree all. with you. No, that's actually what I'm hearing also from people who come on this show and other shows. That's exactly what they say as well. They're still uh, doubling down on the banks. You know, I gotta say, it's, it's fascinating to hear about these record highs every single day really, really not moving the needle in terms of our shrugging it off. And it doesn't seem like a very active market. But Taylor, is there anything that people say that you are hearing about what could potentially disrupt this? I think all the conversations we've had this morning, Lisa, maybe taxes being a headwind, but the conversations we hear on the close are, how do you fight M2 money supply? How do you fight a Federal Reserve that says, nope, we're only focused on the labor market despite inflation? And yeah. all of those signs, despite some of the hawkish tones we've gotten from some of those Federal Reserve heads, has been, we're in it and we're in it for good. Yeah. Mike Wilson pushing back a little bit, saying M2 growth has actually decelerated, so perhaps that could be a headwind. We will continue to discuss coming up on Balance of Power, Jared Bernstein of the Council of Economic Advisors. From New York, this is Bloomberg.